Okay, it is 2 p.m. and I believe, do we have Councillor Solda? She made it on yet? I don't see her on the screen, but I think we have everyone else, so she may still be just trying to get on. So we will call to order our regular meeting of council. And we will just first start by recognizing that we are holding our meeting on the unceded traditional territories of the Sushot and Hoopajesset First Nations. Are there any late items from councillors? Okay, seeing none, any late items from the city clerk? None, Madam Mayor. Okay, wonderful. Then would somebody like to move approval of our agenda? Moved by Councillor Washington, seconded by Councillor Poon. All in favor? Carried. Perfect. And we have minutes from the special meeting held at 9.15 a.m. and the regular meeting held at 2 p.m. on August 10th and the special meeting held at 8 a.m. on August 17th, 2020. Would somebody like to move adoption of those minutes? So moved. Moved by Councillor Poon, seconded by Councillor Corbeil. Any comments on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. And that brings us to public input period, which is an opportunity for the public to submit um, input on topics of relevance to council. A maximum of four submissions will be accommodated and read out by the city clerk. City clerk, did we have any submissions for public input period today? We did not today, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. So we will move on to delegations. And the first one is John Douglas from the Port Alberni Shelter Society. And I see John there, so I think he's just, just loading. <laughs> City Clerk, do we know if if John is, I can see his screen. It just continues to say connecting. I'm not sure, Madam Mayor, unless we try to connect with him offline and just see if there's an issue there. Yeah, I don't see him sitting there either. Um, let's see. So I did let John in to the meeting. I can reach out to him. We do have our next delegation is present in the waiting room. I could call those individuals in and in the meantime, sure. connect with John. Would council be okay with that? Just changing the order of the delegations? Great, let's do that then and just give him a few more minutes to prepare. Okay. okay. So I've admitted the other three delegates and I will contact John. Wonderful. So the second delegation today is the from the Vancouver Resource Society, and we have um, representatives to introduce themselves to Council and present material in the scope of the seniors housing project that they are pr proposing for Anderson Hill. So very excited to um, hear from this group. And I'm not sure, Brad, if it will be you, um, but I will pass it over to the Vancouver Resource Society. Hi everyone, um, it's uh, Cormac Lennon here. I, I'll start off for everybody on this. Um, thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak to everybody today. So we've got, uh, we've got a couple of people on our end that are just gonna speak uh, on, our, on behalf of our delegation, but we're uh, excited to be here today to, to fill you in a bit on, on who the VRS is and uh, the project uh, that we're proposing to, to bring to Port Alberni. Um, the, uh, my, as I said, my name is Cormac Linehan. I'm the project manager on behalf of ERS for the project. Uh, we also have uh, Ken Fraser, um, who's the executive director of ERS, who will touch on um, the history of ERS and, and where, uh, where the um, society uh, originates. We have Brad Tone, the director of development, who uh, will touch on the form and character of the building. Um, and we also have Martin Gardner on the call who uh, will um, talk to the various programs and services that uh, VRS brings uh, as, part of, as part of the society itself. So um, as we have a pretty short time frame here, I'll, I'll hand it over to Ken to start us off. And um, we're obviously available to take any questions after. 
Thank you. Hi, thank you, Mayor Minions and Council for hearing us this afternoon. Um, I'm Ken Fraser, Executive Director with Vancouver Resource Society. I've been in this position for 38 years and counting. So um, we've got a, a very good management group with our organization. We've been around since 1972, um, primarily for the first 40 years of our existence. We provided services for people with disabilities, uh, younger population. Um, most of our client groups were individuals with significant disabilities. Um, those individuals with very few limited opportunities to live in the community. So our challenge would be to get out, uh, find, build, purchase, renovate housing. And then um, that was just step one in getting our client group into the community. Step two is then they, once they're in the community and accessible housing, they need support services. So we would focus on creative ways to provide those care services to those individuals in the community. So that's kind of been our mainstay for the first 40 years. Uh, last 10 years or so, we've been jumping into the, the independent seniors living market. Um, we now have 11 facilities in uh, across BC providing services to um, seniors. We have over 40 buildings, provide services to 1,500 people. Um, and we're always looking for excellent opportunities and amazing communities. And that's why we've uh, keyed in on, on Port Alberni, the, the great lumber town of the mid island. And uh, we wanna come and use some of that lumber to build a, a beautiful facility for the Valley. So um, we're excited about this project. Um, we think it's an amazing location, amazing community, um, and it's gonna fit in very well with our, um, with our existing portfolio, our board of directors is extremely excited about this opportunity. Um, we've um, <clears throat> put applications in with BC Housing to assist us with funding. If we get that, that's great. If we don't, um, we're, we're, our business model works without it. It just creates more affordability if we can get the province of BC on board with us as well. So pretty excited to be here and um, I'll pass it on to, I think it's Brad who's gonna speak next. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Um, <clears throat> Cormac, I'm gonna have you put up a couple of images. Uh, if you could just screen share with uh, mayor and council. Um, A001, A the perspectives on the project, if you could. So <clears throat> there's our building. Um, it's 102 units. It is a five story wood frame building. Uh, we have a one story clubhouse out um, closer to Anderson Avenue and North Park Drive. Um, 102 units of independent living for seniors and persons with disabilities. Eight of the units in the project are fully accessible and they're appropriate for our VRS shared care program. Um, you can ask a little bit more about that if you're interested in what that program is. Um, we've got 10 studio units, 66 one bedroom units and 18 two bedroom units here. Um, <clears throat> so perhaps um, Cormac, you could go to A200, the elevations. So I'll just tell you a little bit about, about the appearance of the building and, and the philosophy behind it. Um, Five-story building, what we've used is a one-three-one rhythm, and that is um, really meant to reduce the height of the building. It's, it's, a, it's a nice um, balance to a five-story building. We also have very, very large overhangs here, which, which um, we coined that umbrella architecture. It, it protects the building. It follows the 4D principles of CMHC for uh, wood frame buildings in, in BC. Um, interesting clubhouse. We've got a, a strong arbor concept along the base of this building. And that arbor concept uh, houses a bistro for 
for the seniors in the building, a reception area. We've got an e-learning center in here. We have a fitness room. We have a games room, <clears throat> a lounge, a dining room, commercial kitchen, a crafts room, private dining, staff offices, and scooter storage. So there's a lot of programs. Um, <clears throat> everything is accessible with no greater than a 5% gradient. And um, that's just a brief summary. Um, so yeah, Cormac, you could, you could maybe um, <clears throat> go back to the, the main screen. Um, take a look at us all and I'll hand this over to Martin to, to talk about our operations and our program. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thanks Cormac for the introductions. Um, great to see you, Mayor Minions again. Um, I believe we've met um, with yourself, Tim and Caitlin on a couple of times. Obviously we'd like to be there right now, but uh, we'll uh, take advantage of Zoom. Um, yeah, so with, with 20 years of experience uh, in, in seniors housing, and Ken mentioned having, uh, I think that we're the largest uh, nonprofit operator of seniors housing in BC or, or will be with the addition of, um, of uh, Timberline, at, uh, Timberline at North Park. Um, we learned a lot about, I guess, what not to do um, at, at, with these, acquiring these, acquiring these properties and have taken a lot of design consideration um, into, as Brad has mentioned, um, as well as on the operation side of things. So with, with 20 years plus experience um, on, on my part of operating and managing, you know, in home care, health care, or acute care, independent living and assisted living, um, you know, what, what, the, what the key part of that is in those 20 something years, nothing has changed. So in your typical IL building, um, you're seeing three meals a day, you're seeing weekly housekeeping, uh, weekly laundry, um, you know, all inclusive, everything is all inclusive and, and nothing has really changed over the, that time. So with this offering, you know, we're looking at more, um, you know, a la carte. So it's got to take a deep breath here. <laughs> more of a la carte. Um, so we've really focused, you know, primarily on, on what, what, what does a 70 year old want um, in, in an operation versus 20 years ago. So we focused on, and in your handout on page five, we really focused on this project on, on, on what's important to a 70 year old. So in current independent living for those counselors, um, perhaps the mayor um, who aren't really familiar with re retirement communities with independent living, there's a lot of acronyms out there. Typical buildings offer three meals, weekly housekeeping, weekly laundry, recreational programs, everything is all inclusive. Um, what you're fine, what we're doing with uh, the Timberline at, North, Timberline at North Park is really making it more a la carte. Um, if you ask, you know, the 1300 seniors that live in our buildings right now, do they enjoy eating every meal in a common dining room? They don't. So what we're offering is a lighter IL packaging in one meal to, uh, per day offered in the clubhouse. We're offering um, a light IL packaging and this keeps the affordability intact and gives people choices and options. Um, and this is a this is a unique offering. This isn't something that's been offered in any other community in BC. So I really want council um, and uh, everyone that's uh, going to be you know supporting this project to realize that this is really a, a world class type of offering. It's a very unique building. Um, so you know a typical um, IL offering, retirement community, so on and so forth. You're running you know anywhere from thirty five hundred to ten thousand dollars a month to pay for things that seniors may not want like three meals like participating in the recreational programs and and so on and so forth so um we're, we're really you know with brs we're really offering a solution here and really trying to attract a younger more active senior because also in our in our statistics uh, in our 1300 units our average age of occupant is approximately 88 years old and the average length of occupancy is, is approximately 24 months. So what we're doing is we're creating um, north, uh, we're creating uh, 20 to 25 percent of our unit straight rentals. So you can move into into this place. You have a, an access to meal programs, recreational programs as you choose. But all you have to do is is rent. Um, what's included are you, your utilities and your emergency response, which should attract a younger, more active senior. Um, in addition to that, um, Brad mentioned all the amenities and services. Um, a typical IL building has, um, has the uh, 
uh, amenity pavilion at the core of the center of the building. So when you walk into an independent living or retirement building, you, you know, you walk into the dining room and you can see 200 seniors eating, you can see everything. Um, whereas with the design considerations that we've done, we've added the amenity pavilion, the clubhouse at the uh, uh, next to the building um, and really focused on design of, of a senior's apartment building with, with small common areas for, them, for the tenants that live in the, in the senior center with the amenities pavilion being um, um, next adjacent and attached to the building, but um, isn't the core focus of that building. Um, what we've done is we've, we've looked at um, ways and means to create um, age in place within um, this building. So by adding seniors rental building, our seniors rental, um, a younger, more active senior, um, all they have to do is rent, we should attract a younger senior. When they need more services and amenities and meals and recreational programs, then they can access that a la carte. We also have um, Brad, um, and the design team have also incorporated um, programming space on every floor. So down the road, we can easily add assisted living um, to, to the building as well, which again promotes that age in place um, campus. So people could move in at a younger age and live there for as long as possible. Why that's important, and, and I, I won't touch, take much more time, but why that's important is um, and perhaps Cormac could pull up the master plan that showcases the, um, the kind of the phase two of the project, which is to introduce um, a, a village in adjacent property to uh, the, um, uh, the Timberline at North, which is 28 bungalow style. Um, uh, and you can see it um, above um, here, you can see this as, as uh, again, trying to attract even a younger, more active senior that would would want to rent or own um, their own place next door. Um, we can provide um, the clubhouse as a, as a form of a membership so we can deliver meals, they can come for meals. Um, so this again is to create that campus um, where people can move at a younger age. Um, with Island Health, we're also looking at per perhaps also allocating some land for complex care, um, which is funded through uh, Island Health. Um, so we can add the addition of complex care to it as well. So really what you have is we're attracting a seven year old, um, again on your handout on page five, really focusing on what's important to a seven year old. Um, they have the option to rent or buy a bungalow um, when they feel that they need to be, you know, have more services and, and health and safety becomes a concern. They can rent an apartment or they can access IL and AL services from within the building. Um, and down the road, we add uh, more complex care and you have a complete uh, master plan adult community at your fingertips. So uh, I would love to have you for about four hours to explain um, how powerful of a, of a model this is. Um, I think if you read through the handout that we've provided, um, it gives a, a really good summary. So I probably ate up a little bit more time than I had planned, but there was a, a lot on the agenda there. Sure, thank you so much, Martin. Are there questions from council? Councillor Paulson and then Councillor Corbeil. Um, you mentioned uh, rents. Uh, what would the rent be for somebody who just took the actual basic without the a la carte menu and um, um, you mentioned a, a, a gap of between three and ten thousand is it somewhat cheaper if you um, just rent yeah i mean or there's two, actually two answers to that question one if um, we are successful in our application for some grant funds from either bc housing or CMHC, we could, um, we will actually have some rents in there at core need, which is 375 a month up to uh, rent geared to income, which is 30% of income. If we're unsuccessful at getting any grant funding, our pro forma right now is penciling out a one bedroom unit at just uh, around $1,070 for a brand new unit. And unfortunately, um, I know that's probably expensive for the Port Alberni market, but it's uh, a two by four in Port Alberni costs so much, almost as much as one in Vancouver. So that's our worst case scenario, but we're cautiously optimistic that BC Housing or CMHC will help us out with some affordability here. 
Okay. I would say that's probably pretty in line with the current just straight one bedroom rental in Port Alberni. Our market rental market has gotten very challenging over the last couple of years. So, you know, if you're able to um, do it for that as a worst case scenario and, and hopefully, um, you know, a lot more affordable, then that's fantastic news. So um, it's good to hear those numbers. I have Councillor Corbeil and then Councillor Poon and Councillor Solda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I have a question. Um, you guys have the uh, long-term care facility out at Long Lake, I believe, in Nanaimo. And just, I'm, I'm wondering, I have a father-in-law who's in long-term care and, uh, you know, heaven forbid this COVID thing goes on much longer, but visitation with seniors is uh, very, very frustrating. I wonder how you're handling it uh, at the facility in Nanaimo. Well, I can, uh, I can, I can, I uh, can, um, respond to that um, just to confirm it's not a uh, our building in, in uh, it's called Lakeside um, Lakeside Gardens in the Nanaimo on Long Lake it's a independent living and assisted living building okay. so it isn't it isn't complex care um, we've been uh, obviously we would have liked to have been at the table here a lot sooner but having 11 properties through COVID we have been COVID free um, I think Brad can talk a little bit about what we're doing as far as design of this building to accommodate um, COVID and future future outbreaks. Um, however, we've we've um, from a from a big you know reflecting back, our organization has done um, some tremendous things working with BC Care, working with BC Seniors. Um, from day one, our leadership team hasn't stopped um, communicating and meeting on a daily basis. Um, and I think I've been a leader um, from across the province, um, especially in independent living and assisted living to do whatever we can to keep the staff working, keep the staff safe. Um, all our screenings um, and so on and so forth um, have been uh, spot on and, and we're typically ahead of the curb um, because there's been so many moving targets with different health authorities, different regulations and so on and so forth. So yeah, we're we're proud to be we're proud to be uh, COVID free um, today. Still, um, we're we're our, our number one focus is to remain COVID free, but also, you know, uh, align with um, uh, keeping our seniors active and and uh, keeping in touch with family and so on and so forth. So, um, I think we've done everything right. Again, I'd probably need four hours to describe <laughs> exactly what we've done as or, as an organization. But um, no staffing issues, no outbreaks. Um, you know, just it's been business as usual and, and doing the best we can to manage this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Brad, did you want to talk to a little bit about the COVID proofing of the buildings moving forward? Would you like to, Brad, to explain that a little bit? Sure, if you want to touch on that. Yeah, I'll just touch on it briefly. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that we've done is that we've, we've really studied how the mechanical systems work in a building like this. So um, everything is zoned from everything else. Every independent living has its own fresh air. Uh, all the corridors are 100% fresh air. There isn't any air exchange between units and, and the public areas. Um, all of our <clears throat> amenity areas are independently zoned for fresh air. So it really is just an approach, a uh, pragmatic approach, uh, saying, look, how can we uh, stop the mixing of air, stop, stop the mixing of, 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 of some of the uses in the building at certain times during a pandemic. Um, one of the things that we can do here as well is that meals can be delivered to rooms when, when we have a pandemic. Is, is I, I can't imagine that we'd be using a common dining room at, during a, a crisis like that. But um, this building's been designed with a lot of forethought to um, to help staff manage their way through these sorts of things. That's great, thank you. Councillor Poon and then Councillor Solda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm very excited about this project, um, but my question is uh, regarding timelines. What sort of timeline are you looking at uh, for your funding? And also um, if you don't get BC housing funding, then uh, what sort of timeline uh, to complete? Perhaps I'll try and answer that as well. Um, <clears throat> the application for the community housing grant went in last week. Um, I expect that BC Housing will probably be working with that application for about six weeks. Um, so we, ho we hope to hear some good news um, soon on that front. 
We're making a building permit application coming up next week. We've got a construction manager on board and we like to think that we can get in the ground on this project uh, in January or February of 2021. So um, we're moving quickly. Um, there's, there's no stop signs with this. It, it, it all looks positive. Whether or not the community housing grant comes together um, is a question. Personally, I think, I think that we will get that. Uh, the application was absolutely stellar. Uh, we worked very hard on it. Um, and that will deliver a tremendous amount of affordability to the community there. Bye, Pietro. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, we have Councillor Solda next. Go ahead, Councillor Solda. I apologize. I thought my mic was off. Okay. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, um, I'm really excited about the project. The question I have is a lot of there's a lot of seniors on pension, it's single seniors. And I know for a fact that people have come up and said, I need to find a place. I'm I the landlord sold my house or sold the house and I have to move and I know one senior particular is living on her daughter's couch right now waiting for a place but she doesn't make much on a pension so I hope you do get it where it will help and make it affordable for those seniors that cannot afford and they're only living on what the government's giving them the other thing too is um, the staffing how how much how many people would you employ or is there anybody employed um, we're estimating about 15 FTEs once we're fully operational, if we get a, a lot of buy-in for the, um, the services side. So we'll have housekeepers and, and chefs and servers and dishwashers. And yeah, so that would be on the assumption that about 80 people buy into a full service package. Love that. The other thing too is there's, I know there's a lot of seniors waiting for something like this because they live in their big houses but they can't move from A to B because there is nothing for B, right? So I think that with the housing shortage that would loosen up some of them to saw, saw, uh, sell their house and move into a, their own little place. So I like that. I just thought well, I'd share three, that. Three or four of our sites um, are the lowest possible pricing for independent living. So you're, if you can imagine three meals, weekly housekeeping, weekly laundry, the building staff 24 seven, you know, at some of our properties like Silver Springs, although it's a, an older style building, um, our, our rents start in around 1300 to $1,400 a month. So I think what you have with VRS being a nonprofit, understanding exactly what you're saying, um, we're, we're getting creative in our unit sizes. So maybe the units are a little bit smaller. We're getting very creative on the, on the service delivery model and, and having people not paying for things that they may not need. Um, also creating opportunities for Island Health to come into the building, um, BC Housing to provide further grants. So we're always cognizant of, of uh, what, what, uh, you know, what, a, what a senior makes on after guaranteed income supplement and old age security, BC Housing will off, be offering safer programs. So I think it remains to be seen as to what that bottom line is, but I don't think anyone out there um, in, in our industry um, um, is able to provide it as, as cost effective as we can. So I think you have the right company at the table to make sure. Um, on the other side, we also want to cater to a higher end that may want you know, larger space and better finishings and more programs and access to that. So, you know, I think um, by creating the clubhouse and having some, a form of a membership that kind of fits the social aspect of housing, which is included um, or could be included in all packaging is, is significant. Um, and we will be looking for families to help out um, as well, their loved ones to, to keep things more affordable as well. So I think we're, we're not quite there to figure out what that magic number is, but we know what the numbers are we what we what we want to try to achieve but i think it's a, a partnership with bc housing and the, the municipality to keep our building costs down and dccs and so on and so forth don't get me wrong i've, I've taken tours of victoria and Nanaimo, and i think they're great and to give them an option is is a perfect thing yeah, thank you for sure. thank you councillor haggard thank you madam mayor my comment just follows up on councillor source uh, I know many, many active seniors are requiring exactly planning development. 
active when they're younger seniors, but they don't want to do the maintenance of owning their own home. They don't want to do the maintenance in the yard anymore. They want the flexibility to travel and and not have be tied down with that work. So I think you're going to be full up very quickly and I'm excited for this project to be happening in Port Alberni. So thank you for choosing our community. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, any other comments from councillors? Okay, with that, thanks very much for coming and presenting. Um, I was fortunate to see the, the drawings of the building a couple months ago and um, since seeing them and before, of course, but um, you really, um, I think, exceeded our, the, my expectations, certainly, of adding just a really beautiful quality building to that area and providing somewhere affordable for our seniors to live that is also a high class, you know, fantastic um, building to live in. So thanks for the work you've done to date and best of luck with your grants going forward and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank thanks you. so much for having us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so we will move on or back to our first delegation. Um, we have John Douglas from the Port Alberni Shelter Society. Welcome, John. Hi, thank you. And uh, what I'd like to do whenever I appear in front of your group, Mayor and Council, I'd like to thank all of you for all the work you do in the community. And so you can go home tonight and talk to your spouses and partners and say, hey, honey, I found out today that it's not a thankless job. Not today. <laughs> you Thank you. But I'm going to keep this very brief. It's a very simple, um, just to let council be aware of, of some one particular project and um, <clears throat> the possibility of moving forward on it. I've got uh, Twyla there, I believe, is in charge of just a few uh, visuals. Basically, what we'd like to do is get council um, to just give staff permission to have some further discussions on this matter and see if we can bring it to fruition. So it's to do with the property, the corner of 10th and Redford. And this has uh, really come about as a, a bit of a good luck in a sense from when I was mayor and had some contacts with the uh, Suncor organization. And then uh, later on, I was talking with uh, Councillor Corbeil and his desire, plus all the councils, I believe to uh, you know beautify the community so I reached out and, and lo and behold, the original person I knew at Suncor was still employed there. And uh, yeah, she said it was very, very possible we could go ahead with a simple greening project for this corner. And so the Port Alberni Shelter Society has taken the lead on this, but we'd like to invite the city in as a partner. We have other, other potential partners um, that we have talked to briefly. And, uh, you know, it all sounds like a go. So we didn't want to come forward to council until we had that feeling that this was a, a good potential to go forward. What would really be a very simple uh, greening of that area. And it really just involves uh, two factors from the city, which would be uh, getting liability coverage and uh, signing on a lease of uh, the length of which and conditions of which um, you know, your staff and through our discussions would be determined and then come back to council for the okay. So that's it. Great. Are there questions from council? I see Councillor Haggard and then Solda. And then Thank Courtney. you, Madam Mayor. Um, John, can you tell me exactly what your definition of a greening initiative is? What is your vision for the corner? Can you just explain that in a little bit more detail? Yeah. Twyla might have an image there. I think of a very simple one that was done in another city. Um, that's the existing one. Yeah, there's one right there. It's really simple. Um, and it doesn't involve a lot of green. But what we were projecting was, you know, we really want to keep this simple so it doesn't get too complex. As you know, projects like this can quickly balloon into a uh, um, things, lots of complexities. So um, we were thinking, and uh, the basic plan is we'll have partnerships with a couple of companies in town that we've already had short discussions with to bring in a bit of fill. So the, the um, condition of the agreement will be that we don't disturb the soil underneath. So we bring in some fill and uh, bring in some grass. And at the most, we'd have some raised beds simply for uh, flowers and, and plants and maybe a few bushes and just keep it really, really simple. Assess, you know, of course, through the conversations with the city, you know, we 
do some more assessment of, uh, of areas where we have to, you know, sort of take care in case of liabilities. So there's a small, um, um, small concrete wall at the rear of the property. So we'd want to retain some sort of a barrier there to stop people from falling over and, and some curbs and things to stop people from driving in. But really it'd be just a small, um, it's a fairly large lot, but a grassy area. There's some sections that are still covered with pavement. So we'd um, you know, probably leave them as they are or enhance them somewhat. And it's really a discussion too for uh, the partners that wanna be involved. I don't think I mentioned ADSS. So Ann Ostwald is very excited about getting students involved in the classes to come this year as far as designing um, the, the, you know, the basic layout of the site. So I hope that helps, Deb. Yeah, uh, one more comment too. The regional district is in the process of writing a letter to the school district uh, in support of any uh, school gardening projects. So you may be able to get something from uh, the regional district as well if you need some additional funding or some support. So that might be another avenue to go, John. Thanks, Deb. But just to reiterate too, we're not looking for funding. Um, you know, we're going to try and approach this so it's a self-sustainable operation. Uh, I mean, we will be looking for some sort of um, way of making it a revenue neutral project, but we're not approaching the city in terms of asking for uh, dollars. We're just, you know, inviting you into the partnership and seeing how we can make it work. Great, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for taking this on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Solda. Councillor Solda, you're muted. What a change. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> brownfield. It's a brownfield. So do we have any idea how long it's going to stay classified as a brownfield? Would anybody have that um, knowledge at all? No? You... Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. So Regarding maintenance, who's going to, you had, um, John, do you have any idea who's going to look after the maintenance? Mm -hmm. Well, we, you know, as I say, it's an ongoing discussion. And so we're in the preliminary stage. Okay. Our idea is to work it out so that it's uh, uh, revenue neutral. Uh, the Port Alberni Shelter Society has a program of social enterprises where people go around and maintain properties. And this is one of the reasons we thought of getting into it. Like currently we maintain uh, properties for um, the low energy group uh, while they're waiting for construction. So cutting their lawn. We're also cutting the lawn for VIHA near the RCMP station. And so it may be that that we would fit our team in there somehow to look after, you know, the maintenance. Okay. That's another reason we want to keep it very simple, you know, so that okay. it's not a, a very complex thing to go in and prune plants and stuff. So we, we want to start very basic. We've also talked to um the group, the gardening group, which looks after the uh, grounds around the hospital, they're a volunteer group, and they'd really like to get involved in terms of advising of us what sort of plants have done best with their experience and that sort of thing. Are you, are you sort of looking at it like a pocket park, all these places? A pocket park, you know what I mean, like Giga Square? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really like something you'd see in, in most... Uh, uh, sort of modern urban centers now they introduce green concepts into you know the central area of the community and this is one area that uh, you know it could really use with some beautification we also like to recognize that the ultimate end use of this property will be for commercial purposes uh, possibly a mix in my mind ideal mix of you know retail residential and commercial space you know maybe a three or four story building but in the meantime, it's been at least 10 years the property's been sitting there. So if we can make it look uh, a little more attractive with very little cost involved, it may uh, open it up to developers' minds too to uh, you know, bring its proper use in you know, years down the road. Well, I'm always a supporter for pocket parks. Um, what you mentioned too is that regarding liability, you mentioned liability. So you want the city to look after the liability insurance? Am I incorrect or? No, no, that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, from my experience, we took on liability for the um, <clears throat> property that we first leased and then acquired from Esso down on the foot of, on Harbor Road there. 
and, and those sort of things. So it'll just be a basic liability thing that the city, from my understanding, is very used to doing. So, um, and it's, uh, I forget the fee, but this is something we'll talk over with staff, you know, and iron that all okay. out. Well, costs, I would love to know the costs. And also you mentioned a lease and that's the lease with the owners. So the lease you're referring to could be one, five years or something like that. How are you looking at that? Do you have any idea? Well, from my personal personal view, you know, with the discussions that I've said, you know, we're still in the preliminary stages, so we don't want to um, make it too complex before we get too far into the conversation. But they have actually asked us uh, how long of a lease uh, we would like. So that'd be something for staff to talk about. And But I think, um, you know, we don't want anything too long, but the most important part is we want to have an escape clause for both parties. Uh, should, you know, we want to uh, move on, say, if a buyer does come along and they want to put a beautiful building there, you know, we'd want to get out in, say, 90 days or six months or whatever staff thinks is the best, best option. Okay. The only concern I have, and you can address that with staff, is regarding the contamination, if there's contamination still because it is at Brownfield, to our liability insurance. So that's something I would want to find out more info on. Yeah. So I just, okay. No, it's very understandable. And I'm glad to raise that too, because uh, that's an issue um, on the part of, of Suncor as well. And they have done this. They have properties, they have a different name other than Brown, uh, Brownfields. It's more politically uh, uh, pleasant sounding to their corporation's ears. I forget what it is at the moment, but um, so they, they've done this in a number of communities across Canada. And their chief concern is that we don't disturb the, the ground. And that's the only time that, uh, you know, the issue of uh, contamination would come up. And so if what we will do is we'll bring in an extra layer on top of the ground and we won't be digging into the ground. And that, that'll be part of the lease agreement. Thanks very much, Cindy. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you. So, and I think that important to keep in mind is that this is preliminary and that any agreement um, at this point, we're just, you know, providing information and then um, the shelter society and the people John are working with will work with staff to bring an agreement to council um, with some of these details ironed out. It's um, just kind of a first look right now. So I have Councillor Washington and then Councillor Poon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, John, uh, my, oh, hat's, John. my hat's off to you for taking on this project. Uh, I'm very be pleased to, to see a corner without uh, eight foot high gates around it and fencing around it. So uh, I wish you all the best and hope we can help you out. And thank you, Dan. And, and I'd be remiss, I mentioned his name before, but I should re-mention uh, Councillor Cole Beal has been working on this, uh, you know, quite a bit with me. You know, one of the things we've discussed in the fantastic uh, template for doing similar things on other properties, which we have many of in the community. So. For sure. Absolutely. So um, Councillor Poon, and then I think we may have had Councillor Corbeil on the list as well. Thank you. I just wanted to echo uh, Councillor Washington's comments. Um, I think it's a great initiative that you've brought forth and, uh, and I wish you all the best with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Corbeil, any comments? Well, most everything has been said. Uh, I want to really thank uh, John and his uh, society for getting behind this. And just uh, to reiterate, you know, I think we all want to see that corner developed into something fantastic. So this wouldn't look like a gag of square. It's going to be something that if all of a sudden a uh, purchaser comes along, it could be removed in short order. And so everything's going to be on top of the surface. We can't uh, mess with the uh, the soils there. We can't disturb them. So uh, this, I think, this is going to be a, a great project. And for people that are driving into Southport, you know, their first stop isn't going to be looking at a disgusting empty lot. So again, thanks, John, to you and your organization. And thank you, Ron. And if I may, uh, Miss Mayor, uh, just to sort of finish up. You know, it's also a great opportunity for partnerships of, with different uh, groups in the in the community. You know, so uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, the Shelter Society, a couple of uh, forestry mills, and some retail outlets, and the students at the school. So, it's a great uh, 
it's a great opportunity for all of us to work together. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Um, would somebody like to, or would anybody like to make a motion if we would like to continue to pursue this, um, to direct staff to work with the Shelter Society? And then of course, they'll come back with something to council. They'll move Madam Mayor. Okay. Second, Second Madam Mayor. Wonderful. So moved and seconded. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for all your work. Okay, so no unfinished business today. So we'll move on to staff reports. And the first one is accounts. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the certification of the Director of Finance dated September 14, 2020. He received in checks numbering 146589 to 146799 inclusive and payments of accounts totaling $1,903,158.72 be approved. Second. Moved and seconded, all in favor. Carried, thank you. And item two from the CAO, appointment of Director of Corporate Services, CAO. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I should start by saying we have some, some unhappy news um, that our city clerk, Davina Hartwell, who's, who's been in the role um, for a number of years and been supporting councils for 20 years. Um, Davina's uh, let us know that she's retiring soon and, um, and she'll obviously be missed um, tremendously. And um, one of the good things that Divina did for us was um, anticipated this, this day, uh, this time uh, a while back, and she helped us hire um, a really good deputy um, clerk uh, with, the, with the eye on, um, on uh, Twyla Slonsky um, moving up to the, the clerk position when Davina did retire. So as we approach Davina's retirement date, um, we um, are seeking counsel's um, appointment of Twyla Slonsky as the, the Director of Corporate Services, um, effective, I believe, at September 28th. Um, we'll, we'll take advantage of that, that change of personnel to change the, the title of the department um, and the position from clerk to corporate services, which is better aligned with the community charter and, um, and with uh, other, the practices of other municipalities. And um, as much as we're really regretting um, Davina moving on um, to the next phase, we um, are really excited about working with Twyla as well. She's um, just been a, as you know, she's been a, an absolute um, um, blessing for us and we have confidence in her ability to move the department going forward. So Madam Mayor, we're seeking council's direction in this. Thank you. Would somebody like to read the motion that's written there? Sorry. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move that council appoint Twyla Sonsky as Director of Corporate Service and assign the responsibility of corporate administration for the city of Port Albany to Slonsky parade of the community charter effective September 28, 2020. Second, and Madam may Mayor. I add, okay. I'd like to return that. And I would like to uh, have a lot of respect for her knowledge, her wisdom and for all your hard work. And you also have a very good heart. And thank you for all your patience that you've shown me being a new counselor when I've had no idea what I'm doing and answering all my dumb questions. And I'm looking forward to working with Twyla over the next two years. Absolutely. And I think we will all echo that. Um, <laughs> and I will just add that um, Davina has been serving the city and, and directly supporting councils for about 20 years from what I hear. So. Um, Davina, your work has been incredibly appreciated and I personally, you know, since getting elected um, on council have heavily relied on, on you to provide guidance to us. Um, and as mayor, I've gained certainly even more respect and appreciation for you and the work that you do. So on behalf of council from all of us, we want to really wish you good luck in your, in your retirement and just really make sure you understand how much we've appreciated you over the years. So thank you for all that you have done. Uh, if I can just say um, thank you so much, Madam Mayor and Council, for your kind words. It, uh, it really has been a privilege um, to serve the, the city for the last 20 years. Um, and it's been actually eight councils, seven municipal elections, five mayors and four CAOs. So uh, <laughs> certainly been around for a while. That's a lot. And, uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with some pretty incredible people along the way as well. So looking forward to a bit of a slower pace for sure and, uh, and looking forward to the next chapter and uh, absolutely wish uh, Twyla all the very best in her new role. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. 
Any other questions or comments? Councillor Paulson, Councillor Washington. Well, Davina, I'm really sad to see you go and I'm excited for Twyla. I just wanna thank you um, for your support of myself, not only as a counselor, but in the 10 years that I worked for um, Parks and Recreation, you were, you were a friend, you were a confidant, you were an advisor. And um, I just wanna thank you so much for everything that you've done. So um, enjoy your retirement. It's not as scary as some people think it is. Yeah, some people retire and end up on council. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I had the privilege uh, to be on council in the year 2000 when uh, Davina did come into our lives. And uh, I'm still here today to say goodbye to her. And I mean, wow, uh, an impressive lady. Um, I'm thinking if we defeat this motion, she'll have to stay. <laughs> I think that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Washington. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And again, thank you to Davina for all the work. And we and thank you mostly for finding a great replacement. So um, we are all very much looking forward to working more with Twyla. And um, it's been fantastic to have her come on in the role that she did and just have the opportunity to get to know her before moving into this role. So um, we know we will be well taken care of. So thank you. Um, on the motion to appoint Twyla, all in favor. Carried, thank you. Okay, and item number three from the Director of Finance, we have the Audit Committee report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, on, on August 10th, the Audit Committee met and uh, some questions were raised from that meeting. Also included in, in, the, uh, in the report is a response from July the 6th for some follow-up that we had from that meeting. So. Thank you. Are there any questions from council on the audit committee? Councillor Paulson. I'm sure there's a perfectly logical um, answer for this, but um, on page 45 of our agenda uh, are the council expenses. And I noticed that the expenses for the FCM for both uh, Mayor Minions and myself are still on the board there. And I'm wondering if we will be receiving credits for the hotel flight and registration. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, Madam Mayor. So we will be receiving the, uh, the uh, not the refund on that, but we've received a credit for the airfare and, and, a, and a credit for the hotel. Thank you. And the registration? And the registration, yes. Perfect. Wonderful. Hey, Councillor Corbeil. I, I'm good, Madam Mayor. Okay. Okay, would somebody like to move receipt of the audit committee meeting? Report. So moved. Moved by Second. Councillor Coons, seconded by Councillor Corbeil. All in favor? Carried. And next from the Director of Finance as well, we have the audit committee, audit, Audit Committee Draft Terms of Reference. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so with the Audit Committee, um, there currently isn't a Terms of Reference for this committee. In January, uh, the, the Council asked that staff uh, bring forward a draft uh, Terms of Reference so the committee could, uh, could have a mandate in scope for their activities. Uh, the audit committee has been a long-standing committee of Council and it consists of three members of Council that are are assigned every year. So we provided the committee a draft terms of reference on August the 10th. And within that, uh, we had the opportunity for uh, the committee to give input, but uh, we, we bring forward the draft today in the, uh, in the form that was uh, uh, recommended by the uh, committee, which includes a clear purpose for the audit committee, for the financial processes and oversight of the city of Portal Burning. Um, there's a slight shift in the timing of our, our meetings, moving from a quarterly occurrence to a semi-annual occurrence, providing clear authority for the committee uh, as, as provided through council. 
uh, communications, looking for a stronger link with our, our external auditors to ensure that uh, we have the time to review uh, any emerging issues or anything that uh, is of, uh, of need to review prior to moving to council. And then duties and responsibilities. Uh, the draft is intended to provide the committee with a forward looking uh, uh, mandate and, and scope to, uh, to assess the risks and to look at process improvements and continue the oversight of the financial governance of, of the city of Portland. So obviously we're adding the, the process improvements and, and risk management to the scope, uh, which is normally undertaken by the committee. And finally, the report format is, is structured within the terms of reference uh, to include a, a document that reflects uh, what is provided to council as far as our, our budgeting process. We'll also have year to dates as we move through the year to show that direct linkage between our budget and financial plan to the actual year to date information. So it's here today for council for consideration and uh, you know, council can adopt as provided or, or have any suggestions for uh, changes before adoption. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Any questions from council? Councillor Washington and then Paulson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I kind of lost my connection for a moment. Um, did, in that, in the uh, terms of reference, did we also add to identify any items that are that end up over budget? I, I sort of, I sort of missed it. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. So the intent is to look at any variances within our, our financial plan, and that uh, the director or or the designate would bring forward a report on those those uh, variances. Uh, that's the intent uh, moving forward so that uh, we can focus in on that uh, rather than going line by line. So that was the intent of the committee. That's great. I think that will be a, a really helpful change. Uh, Councillor Paulson. Uh, I've, I really like the uh, changes for the terms of reference. Just a small question uh, going from quarterly to semi-annual meetings. Um, just want to make sure this is enough to keep the financial commitments on schedule throughout the year, uh, in particular, um, realizing our commitments to um, provincial deadlines and those sorts of things. But uh, if semi-annual, it'll keep us on track. I'm fine with that. So, Madam Mayor, in, in terms to, to Councillor uh, Paulson's uh, question, what our aim is to have the first meeting of the year uh, once we have our audited financial statements ready for draft to uh, to have to be reviewed with the external auditor in in uh, in a meeting with the audit committee. So the, that that first date of the year would be a little bit flexible as far as uh, timing, but it's still in order to meet our our, our provincial deadlines to uh, to submission for the annual audit and our other financial requirements. Thank you. Were there any further questions? Oh, Councillor Paulson, go ahead. I'd just like to make the motion. Wonderful. I'd like to move to accept the revised terms of reference as, as presented. Second. Great. Any questions or council questions or comments? Seeing none. So to approve the terms of reference um, and receive the report, all in favor. Carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, for your work on that. And moving on to item five from the Director of Finance, permissive tax exemptions for 2021 amendment requests. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So in 2019, the uh, council approved a new permissive tax exemption policy. And uh, this was to provide the framework and tax exemption for the four year period uh, through uh, 2019 to 2023 in order to, or in order to provide a, a cap for the permissive tax exemption limit at 1.15%, and also have criteria which would be brought forward to uh, to council as far as organizations that supported youth, mental health, and addiction, and seniors. So it was a, a shift in focus, but also within that uh, change in policy, there was a, a criteria to to reduce the amount of revenue that was. Uh, sorry, to reduce the permissive tax exemption by the amount of revenue in a calculation to uh, lower that exemption. 
but obviously with COVID in, in 2020, there has been an impact on, on some of our, our, uh, our organizations that have seen uh, the reduction through their revenues uh, for the permissive tax exemption. And they have asked us to bring forward a request to uh, look at what uh, the impact would be based on their, their uh, 2020 revenues for the first six months. So we provided council with the uh, possible recommendation that, uh, that could increase the permissive tax exemption based on the reduced revenues that are seen by these three organizations. Uh, and uh, it's for council to, uh, to give direction for us and bring back forward on the, the meeting on September 28th so that we could uh, finalize the permissive tax exemption bylaw by the deadline. So thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to, to thank staff for bringing this forward. Um, COVID has had such an impact on, on everyone, you know, whether it's a nonprofit, a, a municipal government, provincial government, everyone, um, or individuals. And um, it's important to remember, I think, that, you know, some of the policies we put in place last year don't necessarily account for changes that have now happened. So I think it's important for us to be able to, you know, continue to look at these things and make sure that the policies we have in place are not um, further putting pressure or harm on some of our nonprofits. So um, I think this is great to see brought forward. Councillor Solda. I agree with you, Madam Mayor. There's a lot of um, societies that are hurting and they haven't got the any grants or, or are able to um, apply for any grants. So I'm just kind of curious. We have a lot of societies that ha are in the same boat that have applied for tax exemptions. Have we reached out or sent any information to them uh, that they could apply and um, take another look at what we did in the past because COVID changed everything. So um, I'd like to know where we are on that and it can they do still, can they still apply, reapply? So Madam Mayor, the, um, the, uh, the criteria for the exemption was set uh, what staff did is they reached out to these organizations that have a reduction for the revenues that they receive to see if, if, uh, if they would require a, uh, a, a change in, in the assessment of their revenue reduction. And that's what we've done here is we've, we've asked those organizations and they provided us the information. One, in fact, had a better year uh, because of one event uh, earlier this year than they did all of uh, 2019. So just goes to show you how one event could impact the uh, the revenues of one organization. But what we received was three that have asked for the the um, the increase in the permissive tax exemption uh, for 2020. One. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move that the council direct staff to proceed with amendments to the city permissive tax exemption bylaw for organizations whose revenue streams from food and or liquor sales have been impacted by COVID-19 as outlined in the September 8th, 2020 report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Did by Councillor Haggard, seeing no further questions or comments, all in favor. Carried. Thank you. And number six from the Director of Finance, Accounts Receivable Interest and Bylaw Ticketing Collections. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so first off, I just want to uh, state that this, uh, this report contains two different uh, uh, recommendations and I apologize for that. But when we brought forward the uh, request in, in April, it included both these provisions. So this report reflects a change from that, that follow up in April. So the purpose of this report is to provide council with the option to uh, extend, first off, the extend the, uh, the uh, interest waiving period for our, our lease properties, uh, most notably our, our Harbor Key mer merchants. Uh, and this would uh, waive the interest penalty until October. And then at that time, we would uh, provide the each, uh, each leasee with the opportunity for a payment repayment plan of any outstanding amounts. And obviously with, with varying uh, situations and varying uh, lease terms, we'll look at different options uh, that fit uh, with each, each lease holder. So 
And uh, the second part of this uh, staff report addresses the bylaw ticketing uh, provisions that we ceased in, in April. Uh, what we would like to do is, is provide the bylaw enforcement uh, officers the tools to, to, uh, to reach the enforcement uh, requirements and, and, the, and the compliance within the community. So there are certain provisions that uh, allow us to transfer these amounts that are outstanding for ticketing to collections and we'd like to return that uh, for our bylaw staff so they can have the uh, tools in their toolbox to, uh, to deal with any issues with bylaw. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Poon. Uh, what sort of non-payment rate are we seeing uh, among the merchants of Harbour Key? Thank you. Excellent question. The, uh, the merchants at the Harbour Key have been uh, actually very good at, uh, at paying. And there's a, obviously with the March, April, May session when, when very few were open and, and, and had the opportunity, there, there was some uh, outstanding amounts from that time. But Overall, I think uh, over the summer with our support uh, through the economic development uh, department, uh, we've seen uh, uh, good business activity at the Harbor Key. So they've, they've had open, uh, open hours and, and they've been able to manage with the changes that uh, are required. So. Thank you. Any other questions? How many deferral, how many deferral requests are in place? Madam Mayor, there's uh, no deferral requests in place. Uh, there's just non-payment uh, of certain amounts within the uh, within the accounts receivable at this time. Okay, Councillor Poon, would you like to make the first motion? Um, I don't have this uh, agenda in front of me, so. Okay, Councillor Haggard, are you able to make it? I am. Oh, I can make it now if I have this now. Okay. Uh, I'll move that council authorize staff to extend the authorization to waive the interest provisions within all lease agreements held by the city until the end of October 2020 and direct staff to establish a reasonable payment schedule by the end of November. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Haggard. Uh, seeing no more comments, all in favor? Carried. And could you continue with the next one? Councillor Poon, you're muted. Sorry. I'll move that council amend the direction to cease all transfers of outstanding amounts to collections until the end of 2020 by adding the exclusion of bylaw ticketing offences. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. Any comments or questions on this one? Okay, excellent. I'm seeing none, then all in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. And one more from the Director of Finance, uh, Three Stream Solid Waste Collection Services. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, obviously with my his history in, in solid waste, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm taking the lead with this one for the City of Fort Bernie staff. So. Um, back in uh, 2016, 2017, the ACRD received a grant for uh, organic diversion. Uh, orga organic diversion obviously is a very important uh, platform for the uh, uh, BC uh, government at this time and, and then trying to reduce the amount of material going into our landfills. Uh, obviously, this is the, a very large uh, com uh, component of greenhouse gas generation in BC. So they've supported this with a $6 million grant to the Alberta Claypot Regional District. So um, at that time, the grant was applied for and uh, and it looked like that the ACRD would, would build a facility, but since that, that time, the, the scope has changed and they're looking for private companies to provide that service. With that, um, the, the ACRD requires these changes, so we have to comply with these changes that uh, the ACRD is needing to meet their, their waste diversion uh, targets. At this time, the City of Port Alberni provides only garbage service uh, and uh, through our, our, our city staff with the contract for recycling provided by the Elberney Cl Claypot Regional District uh, through a contractor. The cost of the service uh, has been, uh, for the recycling service was reduced in, in 2014 because of the uh, Recycle BC uh, incentives that were provided. Historically, that was about $30 per year for recycling service, but 
the incentives now cover that at the Alberta Claypot Regional District. The City of Port Alberni has an approximate $100 per year for their, their solid waste uh, garbage service. Uh, this cost has not increased since 2012. The, uh, the cost of tipping has since increased at the Alberni Claypot Regional District. It was approximately $95 uh, at the time of uh, 2012 and, and it's around $130 right now for tipping fees. So with that, our costs have gone up, but we have not passed that cost onto the uh, utility bills. So the actual cost of the service is about $135, uh, including the replacement for carts that are in our equipment replacement program for that service. City staff and the Elbering Claypot have been looking at options to deliver the, uh, the solid waste services and all three streams within the city of Port Alberni. The city of Port Alberni will be the first of the Alberni clay pot uh, municipalities to, to uh, start the organics and, and obviously would be the biggest of, of all the three. And with that, uh, the, the change in scope with the cart purchase enabled the ACRD to provide us with carts for all three streams. Um, back last year, I believe it was, we had a, a new truck that has a split bay that provides us the opportunity to pick up two different streams of waste at one, one stop. And obviously when we look at cost, we're trying to reduce the cost to a manageable amount and, and look at the lowest cost option to provide as a recommendation to council. So with this, the, uh, the ACRD staff and, and city staff reviewed all the options and, and the, the true cost of delivering a service is the amount of, of, of visits that, that a truck must make at, at, at each residence. So at this time, we have two visits uh, uh, every second week and one visit on, on the alternate week. Uh, moving forward with organics, we would have a program that provides a weekly pickup of organics because that's the odorous material and garbage and recycling with alternate. So obviously we've, we, we want to reduce the cost as much as possible in this new format and a single visit by one city truck comes out to be the lowest cost option based on our analysis. And of course, we had saved up over the past few years as far as uh, cart replacement, and that will be avoided. That was about half a million dollars in cart replacement costs. And obviously, we do have a, a automated service that we'll be providing. And with an automated service, Recycle BC mandates that we have a, a transition plan because the the current delivery of service allows the operator to look at the recycling component to see if there's any contamination within the bins. And at that time, they have the ability to pull out anything or leave anything behind at the residence. Now with the automation, we have to come up with a plan and submit that to Recycle BC. Uh, we will be, uh, we will be uh, contracted through the ACRD to provide this service. And the plan has to be uh, submitted before we can move that to that automation process. But we've seen some success in, in Nanaimo recently, so we can glean some of the information that they provide to the residents, a good communication package and a plan as far as uh, reducing the amount of contamination. And with the, the grant uh, funding, the ACRD is looking at providing us with cameras and, and tracking software to enable us to track what materials are being deposited into the uh, truck in order to, for us to have that correction and, 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 and the, uh, the uh, contamination or any materials that are non-compliant uh, going into the garbage truck. Because in the end, the ACRD needs to start diverting certain materials from the landfill. So as mentioned, weekly organics uh, uh, would be, uh, would be in, in, in the uh, program that would be provided, recycling every second week, and then garbage every second week. And it's really important to note that the material that, that, that smells is usually your organic material. There's obviously some situations that it might not meet uh, uh, the, uh, there, there might be some materials that might not be pleasant in, and then we look at diapers as one uh, being a, a concern, but uh, we can address these concerns with the residents uh, through program delivery. The communications with the uh, program has to be solid. We, we need to make sure that uh, we work with the residents and the ACRD is going to provide us with uh, communication uh, support and, and they will be driving that and helping making helping the, the residents ensure that they are meeting the program needs and, and, uh, and, and diverting the right materials. 
and we'll work with the ACRD over the next few years to make sure that this uh, this meets their their goals and objectives. Obviously, this is something that uh, we need to provide. Uh, it's it's a it's a process that that most municipalities are moving to because of the provincial mandates and regulations. The ACRD has 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 the mandate to do this, and we'll support them as much as possible to meet their 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 goals and objectives. So with that, um, we, we believe that uh, the the uh, best lowest cost option is to provide this service through the city of Port Alberni staff with one one truck visiting the residents every week. So, thank you. Thank you very much for all of that information um, and for working with the regional district on this. I think it's something that, um, you know, those of us who have been on council for a while are excited to finally see coming forward. It's been a priority for the city for, you know, quite some years and it's um, been great over the last couple of years to see it become a real priority for the regional district as well. Are there any questions from council? Councillor Haggard and then Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I know a lot of people aren't going to be very happy because their bill for their garbage pickup is going to increase. But as part of our job, we have to do long term planning. And by picking up organic waste, it's going to significantly increase the life of our landfill by a number of years. And in order to close the landfill, it will cost millions of dollars. So at the end of the day, you pay a little bit now, or you're gonna pay a lot later on. And there may not be an opportunity to ever even get another landfill like we have now. So I think this is the best course of action. Other, as Andrew said, other communities are already doing it. We're way behind the times here. So I'm very in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I too am excited about this. I, I'd spoken to Andrew about the, the software to detect the bad stuff that ends up in the truck and he's assured me that we'll get all those bugs worked out. But uh, heck, to get that uh, compost weekly and then your, 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 uh, or your, your waste and your, your garbage done alternately, I'm, I'm sure there's no problem. There won't be an issue with it and we've already got the trucks. So, uh, Quite excited. Um, I just, like Andrew says, I think we need education of what goes into recycle and what goes into compost and what still goes into your household waste, uh, especially the compost, because that'll be new to a lot of folks. So uh, we get it together, spell it all, all right, and I think it's going to work wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, um, Andrew, I am wondering um, if people do, so one thing I've been told is that um, we don't take soft plastic because the soft plastic gets into the, the pieces of the truck and can damage um, the truck that currently picks up. And I'm not sure if that's the accurate reason for why we don't take soft plastic or not. But what I'm wondering is, do we have potential for the trucks, our trucks to be damaged if people put in contempt, if people you know recycle, I would imagine, um, soft plastic and glass are some of the really common pieces that people don't realize are not currently allowed in recycling. Um, so are we at risk of any damage to our truck with these or is it just a matter of them not being um, accepted by by the processor? Good question, Madam Mayor. The, um, the soft plastics are a problem in the facilities that do the automated sorting, not so much in our trucks. Uh, you know, it's just a compaction uh, uh, method in, in our trucks whereas when you're in 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 a in a recycling facility they're blowing different materials off and these things get wrapped up uh together with the recyclables so often that leads to the contamination uh when it comes to glass uh it's important that we keep glass out of the uh the organics uh and recycling because that will contaminate the materials so it's more of a contamination issue than it is with a uh a damage to our equipment Thank you. That's very helpful. And um, lastly, um, you did mention um, that we have saved up money through our fees to replace um, the garbage bins that we currently have, and we won't need to do that now. So um, if I understand correctly, we have gotten a grant for the replacement of those bins and purchasing of the compost bins. Is that correct? So there won't be a cost to the city taxpayers for that? Uh, that's correct, Madam Mayor. So what we see is approximately about a $1.5 million uh, grant uh, receipt for our carts. Uh, 
it's approximately half a million dollars to outfit uh, every household in the city of Port Alberni with a cart. And we're going to be doing that three times over with the recycling, organics, and new garbage carts. So we had uh, in the financial plan about $550,000 set aside in the earth. Uh, that's, we're avoiding that cost, but it's important to know that we haven't been earthing for the trucks within the garbage component of our service. So it, we'll have to bring forward the, the finalized costs once we get those to council to show the savings from that. But this is definitely the best, lowest cost option for council to consider. Great, yeah, and it's it's great to be able to avoid that cost because of course that would be a, a big cost to people if we had to add all three of those bins. So um, having that grant makes a, a huge difference for sure. Are there any other, Councilor Haggard? Just a silly question, the old bins that people are using now, what will happen to those? Because they'll be obsolete. That's a good question. And we haven't identified what we could use with them because the last thing we would like to see them do is end up in the landfill. And we do have, um, you know, I, I look at my cart, uh, it's in pristine condition and uh, and we'll have to find a way that, that you know, best meets our, our diversion goals and, and, and best use of, of, of our, our equipment that we have, so. It would feel a bit counterproductive to put them in the landfill. So I'm glad that's something we're thinking about. Councillor Councillor Poon. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering um, in terms of uh, city owned garbage cans that are you know scattered around uptown and so on, um, will there also be a three stream uh, method for that? Madam Mayor, this is a residential service that we're providing. It's uh, it doesn't include any commercial bins, uh, so the city of Toronto provides that residential uh, option right now, and that's what the uh, the work that we've been doing on as far as uh, uh, the program with the ASRD. Uh, that wasn't my question, but anyway, um, so, what I meant was, you know, public garbage cans that are within our uptown area. Will they uh, later have a sorting mechanism? Yes. Sorry, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, through to uh, Councillor Poon uh, for the misunderstanding there. Uh, at this time, no, there isn't a, a diversion uh, plan for the garbage carts in the uptown area. Um, that it's very difficult to manage the the streetscape sort of uh, garbage. Uh, uh, garbage bins so it's something that we'd have to look at if we want to offer a service uh, such as that uh, down the road but right now the focus is on residential thank you councillor haggard would you like to read the motion thank you madam mayor i move that council supports a three steam solid waste collection service to include recycling organics and garbage by the city's automated trucks and direct staff to work with the Alberti Claycott Re Regional District to negotiate the required contracts for the service delivery. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you, moved and seconded. And Councillor Washington, did I skip you? Yeah, sorry about that. Go ahead. That's okay, Madam Mayor. Uh, when, when the Director McGifford was talking about the household waste pickup, uh, we're gonna do it with the existing trucks. So. Again, like he says, if, if my household waste bin's in pristine condition, I don't need it replaced because the same truck's gonna be picking it up. You'd only need the, uh, the recycle and the organics bin. Uh, am, am I missing something? This is a great question and I had it also. So go ahead, um, Andrew. So, so with the new bins, thank you, Madam Mayor, and great question, uh, Councillor Washington. With the new bins, they'll have an RFID in them. So we can identify what property that bin's associated with. So if there's anything that we need to do as far as follow up to make sure that that, that property is not being compliant with the waste diversion, we can do that. Our current bins do not have the RFID in them. Thank you, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, but we're not doing that now for regular. Is, is, a, is the focus on recycling and compostable? I can understand that to, to be able to tag that, but the regular household garbage, does it need to be tagged? I would imagine it'll be because we'll be able to see if people are kind of ignoring those services and putting compost into their um, garbage. I thought the same thing. We're going through the same thought process right now, <laughs> Councillor Washington. Um, those people, you know, they obviously we want to make sure what's going into the other two is what is supposed to go in there, but it's almost looking for the absence of um, 
materials that are supposed to go in the green or blue bin in the garbage. Go ahead. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess there is no way to attach that that tag to existing garbage cans. Just uh, I just I can't get my head around what the heck we're going to do with all those those green bins of people you're using right now. And I mean, if we if we can just attach a tag to them, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to figure this out. I think that's a great idea. Um, is that something that would be possible, Andrew? Um, Madam Mayor, I think that that's a, a great option. And, and I know that the ACRD is focused on diverting waste and we don't want to see these being wasted. So whatever we can do, we'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll take the best path, the lowest cost, and uh, we'll definitely think about ways to ensure that we're not uh, getting rid of something that's in perfect condition. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have the motion moved and seconded. Are there any further questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you very much. And thanks you, Andrew, for all of these reports today. <laughs> okay, moving on to item number eight from the Manager of Community Safety, 3118 Third Avenue, the Harborview Apartments Remedial Action. Welcome, Gaylene. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor. Uh, there are two reports before consideration of imposing remedial action requirements on properties that seriously can contravene building and fire codes as well as city bylaws. The first is the Harborview apartment at 3118 Third Avenue. The report is detailed and ensured in such a way as to provide council with all the information it needs in order to make decisions based on the evidence provided. Information is included in the report outlining council remedial action requirements as well as the process that must be followed. The registered owner of this particular property is Folded Hills Farms based out of Victoria. The property was declared a nuisance under the city's nuisance abatement bylaw in 2018. And following some minor improvements, it was removed from the city's nuisance list in 2019. Since that has deteriorated significant and increasingly high resources from, from police, fire, building office. The continuing pattern of nuisance Sorry. activity. Sorry, Gaylene. Um, is anyone else having a hard time hearing Gaylene? Um, Gaylene, you're really cutting out, unfortunately. Um, and um, just because the content of this um, report is so important, um, City Clerk, do you know if there's anything we could do to improve the I know, unfortunately, I think it's a city hall issue. Um, I just don't want the, <laughs> I know we, we often have this when there's too much, many of us using the uh, Zoom at, at city hall, but um, I just don't want council to miss the content of this report um, or the public. CAO, any Would it be thoughts? useful for me to move upstairs to Madam come upstairs to an office? I see that Gaylene's using a boom mic. Um, that might be one issue if the mic's, if the mic's not close enough to your, to your uh, mouth. And no. Madam Mayor, uh, it's, it's actually been one of the worst audios of Zoom meetings I've ever heard. Uh, the whole meeting has had bad audio. It's been choppy throughout. Um, our manager community safety's audio is actually coming through at a volume level that is that can be heard, but it's quite statically quite choppy. And I'm not sure if that can be improved uh, because it's happening for everybody. Um, well, I've only... Personally, I've only heard it happening for Councillor Haggard a bit. Um, it's not the volume level. It's just that it's cutting out so much that I can't hear what she's saying. I wonder if um, we could, um, you know, recognizing the importance of this, I don't want to rush it. Um, would Gaylene possibly be able to move up to Tim's office and then we could skip um, just so you don't have to rush. We could go move forward to... Um, skip your two reports and come back to them and move forward to um, item, I think the next one is item 10, the Alberni Brewing. Would that be okay with council? Then that would give um, a few minutes for Gaylene get, to get set up in a different office. It's, it's worse in the basement, maybe. <laughs> oh. okay, council. I'm gonna... okay, if council's okay with that, then um, we will just make that change. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, we will move to item 10, which is hopefully our, the city clerk is ready. Um, from the city clerk, we have the Alberni Brewing Company application for lounge endorsement for 4630 Adelaide Street. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, this is a um, endorsement for our lounge endorsement for uh, the establishment that Alberni Brewing Company is um, is setting up at 4630 Adelaide Street. Uh, the Liquor Control and Cannabis Regulation Branch uh, requests that Council considers the location and person capacity and hours of liquor service of the establishment and, um, and provide the branch with a resolution and comments. Uh, which covers the impact of noise on nearby residents, the impact on the community if the application is approved, the view of residents and a description of the method used to gather the views, and a recommendation uh, including whether or not the application be approved and the reasons on which um, that <clears throat> is based. So the report uh, provides details regarding uh, the location, which is in the Northport downtown core district. Um, in response to the ad that was placed uh, in the local newspaper um, and mailed to all residents and businesses within a 30, 75 meter radius, uh, yeah. uh, we did receive one response, uh, which is attached to the agenda from the resident who lives immediately to the rear of the property. Uh, they expressed their support of the business, uh, but some concerns about the outdoor uh, patio space being you know, relatively close to, to their property. Um, we did forward uh, that letter to uh, Al Alberni Brewing Company, and they are going to reach out to that individual just to discuss their concerns. And we will also provide their response to Liquor Cannabis and Regulation Branch. Uh, they did say uh, that um, the outdoor patio space is only going to be seasonal. Uh, their hours of service are in uh, sort of very similar hours to the other brewing companies that are open in the community and that uh, the, the drawings that were provided are a little bit deceiving and they just wanted to clarify the space between their patio and the, the neighboring yard which is about 40 feet uh, and as I mentioned they, they do intend to reach out to that resident to, to discuss concerns and other than that Madam Mayor I'd be happy to answer any any questions that you may have. Wonderful are there any questions from Council? Easy, no questions. Um, Councillor um, Corbeil, would you like to read this motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move that the Council for the City of Port Alberni support the application for a lounge endorsement for Alberni Brewing Company located at 4630 Adelaide Street and forward the report from the City Clerk dated September 9th, 2020 to the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch, LCRB. I'll second that. Okay, moved and seconded. Any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Carried, great. Okay, and we will just um, check back in and see, and no rush, if not, we can move on to item 11. Oh, there we are. You are CAO Tim Ply now, and I, I apologize for that. I just want to make sure that we're all able to um, to hear the full report. No, nope, it was good practice. <laughs> <laughs> Expect to run upstairs every time you have to do this. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Madam Mayor, uh, there are two reports before Council today for consideration of imposing remedial action requirements on properties that seriously contravene building and fire codes as well as city bylaws. The first is the Harborview Apartments at 3118 Third Avenue. The report is very detailed and is structured in such a way as to provide council with all the information it needs in order to fully consider the issues and make decisions based on the evidence provided. Information is included in the report outlining council's authority and the community charter to impose remedial action requirements, as well as the process that must be followed. The registered owner of this particular property is Folded Hill Farms based out of Victoria. The property was declared a nuisance under the city's nuisance abatement bylaw in 2018 and following some minor improvements, it was removed from the city's nuisance list in 2019. Since that time, the property has deteriorated significantly and has significant and increasingly high volumes that consume resources from police, fire, building and bylaw services. The continuing and sustained pattern of nuisance activity inside the building and on the property is negatively impacting the community and creating immense concerns for the safety of the residents, visitors, workers, city staff, and first responders. There are various appendices attached to the report. Appendix one contains correspondence seeking compliance to various building and bylaw contraventions, as well as provides for photographs clearly demonstrating the continued building safety and nuisance issues. 
All the bylaws that are being contravened are listed in, and specifics of breaches and nuisance issues are addressed in detail. Appendix two includes building inspection correspondence. Appendix three is a correspondence from the RCNP inspector and appendix four outlines fire inspection issues and noting particularly that fire equipment is no longer being tested at the property due to safety and cleanliness concerns. Due to the bylaw infractions calls, calls requiring emergency response and impacts to public health and safety, staff recommends that council by resolution declare the building to be in a hazardous condition, a nuisance and so dilapidated and unclean as to be offensive to the community and impose the remedial actions as outlined. The property owner has been advised that this issue is before council today. Should council proceed with the recommended resolutions, formal notice will be provided to the owner outlining the remedial actions required and the timeline for completion. The owner will have an opportunity to appeal to council for reconsideration of the resolution by providing written notice within 14 days of the date the notice is sent. Thank you. Unmute myself. Um, thank you very much for that information and for all the work that I can see went into this report. Are there questions from council? Councillor Haggard and then Councillor Kuhn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. First of all, I want to thank the staff for the many, many, many hours that you spent on these two files. I see many comments from the public going, why does it the city do anything? But there's, they have to understand that there is a process that we have to go through because we do have to abide by the letter of the law in order to move forward to legal. Um, my question is because are unsafe and not habitable for persons, how can the city place a do not occupy order on these buildings? Because my concern is because they're and so unsafe and they're so uh, deteriorated that either the owners of the building or the city won't be able to get any contractors to go in there. In the report, there is a comment of um, a couple of uh, companies that refused to go in there any longer because it was so, so bad. So can you comment on that, please, Gailey? I can't comment on the do not occupy order, but um, I'm, I'm sure that if there's some provisions made where there's the owners are doing some cleaning up that to a satisfactory level where contractors would come in. At this time, they're ignoring everything. So we're hoping that if they can start with this process, this process, then contractors will start to come in. Because I'm just concerned that this will go on and on and on and then people will continue to live in there. That's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, and I think that's a very fair concern um, with the current condition. Councillor Poon. Thank you. I'm very concerned about the uh, condition of the building and, and thank you, Gaylene, for uh, producing this report. And I, I do agree with many of the recommendations. Um, I think that my concern is um, if we were to impose uh, these orders today, um, what would happen uh, to the displaced residents, residents and uh, where would they be housed? The um, a lot of the renovations that you're looking that are detailed in the report are just that they're just renovations, minor ones, uh, doors, door locks, door frames, window frames. It's not a whole remediation of an apartment. Yeah, so I think the intent would be, and and certainly that was a question I had when I started reading through the report. But when you read through the long list um, and really think about that work that you know needs to be done, I would imagine most of that can be done with people living there. Um, and I will let council know that um, fr from a proactive um, you know, side, I did have a conversation with uh, BC Housing very recently on this, um, on this, on this property specifically. And um, I wasn't sure, of course, what direction was going to be coming forward at that point, but we did talk about the condition of this property um, and what some possible options may be. So I do have a follow-up meeting booked with BC Housing now that um, assuming that this goes forward, um, that we will kind of have them um, up to date and on the line in case there is some action needed on their end. Um, we will make sure that if, you know, tenants um, are displaced through any of the work that we are able to keep BC Housing updated and, and have them involved in that, but certainly optimistic that this building will be improved and tenants will be able to stay. Councillor Solda. 
Um, Madam Mayor, when this building was first built after the last fire and it was rebuilt, we had a lot of hopes that, wow, this is going to make a great impact on the community, not in the way it's going now. And it's really disappointing that there's still slum landlords out there. I call them slum. I'm sorry. Um, I can't even imagine what inside the apartments must look like when you got people building, putting motorcycles up, the boarded um, rooms, windows and stuff like that. It's really disappointing. And, you know, I had a lot of pride when it was first, first built. It looked great. It was a, per it was, it was really nice. And I'm really disappointed in where it's gone. And it, I don't know, I don't think the landlord lives here. If he maybe lived in the building, it might have been a different story. It's just too bad. I'm just really looking at the pictures. It's really harsh. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. It's very upsetting to see the pictures and see how some people in our community are living. Councillor Paulson. I know that we have a great concern for um, if that building happened to be closed or do not occupy, uh, where are the residents going to go? The building in its present state right now is dangerous to, I think, the tenant's life, health, and well-being. And um, we've got to be, there's got to be alternatives to this building. And, and I just want to thank staff for moving forward on this. Um, it's another wake-up call. There was some action done in 2019. Um, it looked great from the outside, but the photo evidence here in this report uh, doesn't lie. And um, all of the residents, I think, are at risk um, for their life and for their well being, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I think it's time to move forward on both of these properties. But uh, thank you, staff, for doing this. Um, I'm more concerned about getting this thing into a healthy, livable thing and it is not livable the way it sits right now it just isn't it's in horrible deplorable condition and um, thanks for all of the the long list of things to be done and um, there's a lot of a lot of stuff there that could be costly and who knows what the future of the building will be thanks for listening it's a bit of a rant because i think this is way past due way past due Thank you very much. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, sorry, I got several things running in my head right now. Um, thank you to staff for the report. A uh, little alarming to see doors welded closed. Um, first question I guess I would have would, is it the same owner that did the 11th hour cleanup back in 2019 or is it different owners now? Same, same owners. Same owners. And um, also, Joe six pack rumor on the street is, is that some of these tenants, their rent is actually, if, if they're on a government assistance, some of their rent is paid directly to the landlord and they're, that's all they got is living there or is, or is that just a rumor? Uh, we, we don't have the specifics on that. Okay. No, it's, it's just, if that's, if that's all they can get for what they've got and he's not willing to clean it up, it, it, it's, you know, there's something really wrong with our system, but, uh, no, I, I would really hope that they could clean that up because like you say, we don't want to displace those people, but uh, uh, those pictures just, pictures are worth a thousand words and holy wow, we're in trouble. Thank you, Councillor Washington. And I will just add um, that I know through my conversations with BC Housing that um, in the last month or so, the um, BC Housing did approve 20 new rental assistance program um, in our community. So basically for 20 new people um, who, are, are houseable and simply struggle with affordability, um, they have a rental top-up program basically available. So if there are people um, living in those buildings that are only living there because of affordability and they could find another apartment somewhere on their own if they could afford it, then those 20 new rental assistance um, plan should be very helpful to that. Of course, we know, um, I mean, most people would probably assume based on what we see, you know, um, in the neighborhood of the building that there's obviously issues uh, more significant than just um, affordability in a lot of the situations, um, mental health and, and addiction challenges as well. So, but that is available. And I think that's a positive thing. And, and BC Housing has specifically spoken about some of the residents in that building and the next one we're going to talk about and trying to target uh, moving anyone who is able to. 
to a to a safer and more available home. Councillor Corbiel. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for reaching out to BC Housing. You know, this is very uh, much needed. This housing that we're talking about. But saying that just because somebody is poor or has mental health issues, they shouldn't have to live in the squalor that we see in the pictures that the uh, 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 manager of uh, community safety uh, showed us. Um, it, it not only uh, for the, the people that, that live there, but just that part of town, you see uh, you know, the Dog Mountain Brewery right across the street, investing a lot of money into a very nice facility and then we have this uh, going downhill right before our eyes. In a perfect world, the owner will fix this up and these people will continue living there and they'll live it with uh, dignity. And I, I hope that's what happens, but I guess we have to be prepared for, for plan B as well. So thank you uh, very much uh, staff for finally getting on to this. Thanks. Thank you, um, Councillor Solda. Just a quick question to staff. Is the balcony safe? Like the little balconies? I mean, I didn't see that in the report. I mean, it, it, when you look at the pictures, you know, like there's a few motorcycles and um, stuff like that out in the front. And is it a repair service out there? You know, like, so I would like to know, is the bal anything to do with the balcony? Would that be in your report at all? Or did I miss that? No, it, uh, the building inspector didn't get to get a chance to get into the balcony to inspect it, although you can see some rot in some areas and you can see where um, it slopes a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. but he, the owner would have to look at that and take responsibility. Wow. And, and also when we talk about the health and safety and welfare of the residents that are in these um, apartments, it's not just the residents, it's the community. It's the people who walk to the bank or to the stores. There's safety there. There's, it's, it's, it's a whole picture. It's not just them. So I just want to focus on that too. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Absolutely. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Councillor Paulson. Uh, <coughs> um, under number three, A.3 is replace all broken or missing hand railings or staircases. And I would think that would apply to the balcony as well. I would hope. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Um, Madam Mayor, just a quick comment that item 10 uh, does reference the balconies, replace or repair all fire escape stairs, balconies and porches to a safe and clean condition. Thank you, that's great. Okay, any further comments on this? Okay, um, I will ask, we're gonna read these one by one. So each number will be a separate motion. Um, so we will ask who wants to do all of this reading? Councillor Washington. Okay, fine, Councillor Poon, go ahead. Uh, only if I'm given the, uh, yes, the screen. Thank you, Twyla. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, I'll move that council pursuant sections 72 and 73 of the community charter considers that the property at 3118 Third Avenue and having a legal description of lot nine, lot 73, district lot, lot one, ALD PL VIP 197 and lot eight, lot 73, district lot one, ALD PL VIP 197 described as the property is in an unsafe condition and that the structure on the property, the structure contravenes the BC building code and the Port Alberni building standards bylaw number 49752018. Thank you, is there a seconder? Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, any further comments on this? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried, and you can continue with number two. Yes, I'll move that council pursuant to sections 72 and 74 of the community charter declares that the structure and the discarded materials and refuse about the structure on the property are a nuisance and are so dilapidated and unclean as to be offensive 
to the community. Is there a seconder for that one? Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Seeing no comments, all in favor. Carried, thank you. Number three. And further that council pursuant to section 73, or 72, 73 and 74 of the community charter resolves that Folded Hills Farms being the registered owner of the property, the owner is hereby required to one, carry out the following work within 30 days of the date that notice of this resolution is sent to the owner. Repair, sorry, repair the exterior walls of the structure, including copying and flashing to restore the integrity of the building envelope to a condition sufficient to protect the structure from the weather and from infestations of insects, rodents, and other pests including without limitation by remediating any holes, breaks, loose or rotting boards or timbers and any other condition which might permit the entry of insects, rodents or other pests to the interior of the walls or the interior of the structure. And B, applying paint, stain or other protective coating to the exterior walls so as to adequately protect them against deterioration and two, repair downspouts in such a manner as to control drainage so that runoff to neighboring properties and access ways is eliminated. And three, replace all broken or missing hand railings on staircases. And four, remove or permanently cover all graffiti from the exterior of the structure. And five, replace all broken, cracked or otherwise compromised exterior windows to a weather tight condition which operates to provide light and ventilation. And six, replace or repair all damaged, decayed or deteriorated windows, sashes, window frames and casings. And seven, replace or repair all exterior doors of the structure so that they are weather tight, operational, fit tightly within their frames when closed and locked so as to prevent entry with at least one entrance door capable of being locked from both inside and outside. And eight, replace or repair all interior entrance doors and door frames for each unit and provide locking doorknobs. And nine, replace or repair the roof of the structure to a watertight condition with no leaks. And 10, replace or repair all fire escapes, stairs, balconies, and porches to a safe and clean condition, free from rot, holes, cracks, excessive wear, and warping or hazardous obstructions. And 11, replace or repair all fire protection systems, heat detections, smoke detections, fire alarms, fire extinguishers, sprinkler systems, exit signs, emergency lighting, fire separations, and means of egress required by the BC Building Code and BC Fire Code to a functional and unobstructed condition. And 12, remove and properly dispose of all refuse from the interior and exterior common spaces of the property, including food waste, combustibles, non-combustibles, furniture, appliances, tires, construction waste, stripped or wrecked automobiles, trucks, trailers, boats, vessels, or machinery, parts or, or components of any of the aforementioned to an appropriate disposal site. And 13, empty, clean, and repair the garbage disposal bins on the property. And 14, eliminate all rodents, vermin, and insects from the structure. And 15, uh, permanently remove all objects placed, stored, or maintained upon any balcony, hallways, or entranceway, which may interfere with access or egress to or from the building in case of fire or other emergency. And 16, prepare a fire safety plan in cooperation with Port Alberni Fire Department. Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Any further questions? Seeing none, all in favor. Any opposed? Carried. And you can continue with number four, please. Yes. 
And further, that council pursuant to section 78 of the community charter directs staff to advise the owner that the owner may request that council reconsider this resolution by providing written notice within 14 days of the date on which notice of the remedial action requirement was sent to the owner. Thank you. Is there a seconder for that one? Seconded by Councillor Paulson. Seeing no comments, all in favor? None opposed, carried. Okay, and further that council pursuant to section 17 of the community charter authorizes city staff to carry out any requirements set out in paragraph two of this resolution, which the owner fails to complete within the time permitted by this resolution and to recover the cost of carrying out such requirement from the owner as a debt. Thank you, is there a seconder? Okay, seconded by Councillor Corbeil. And Councillor, are there any questions or clarifications needed um, on this last item, which gives staff the authority to do the work um, or to plan to do the work if um, the owner doesn't comply. Okay, seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you. Okay, thank you Councillor Poon for that. Um, and again, thank you to staff. Um, I know we have another one similar here, but I think very much um, this is about setting a, a, a better standard for the type of housing we're gonna allow in our community. So I appreciate all the work that's been done on it. Kayleen, go ahead with the next one. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The second report before council for consideration of imposing remedial action requirements on a property that seriously contravenes building and fire codes as well as city bylaws is the Port Pub at 5170 Argyle Street. Again, this report is very detailed and structured in such a way as to provide council with all the information it needs in order to make decisions based on the evidence provided. The registered owner of this particular property is 8899 Limited out of R Richmond. The property has three business licenses, one for CJ's Place, the Port Pub and the Port Hotel, and the hotel is currently renting out rooms on a monthly basis. This property receives the highest call volume in Port Alberni, requiring the most resources. These resources include police, fire, building, and bylaw services. The continuing and sustained pattern of nuisance activity inside the building and on the property is negatively impacting the community and creating immense concern for the safety of the residents, visitors, workers, city staff, and first responders. There are various appendices attached to the report. Appendix one contains correspondence seeking compliance and photographs demonstrating the continued building safety and nuisance issues upon the property over the past eight months. The bylaws that are being contravened are listed and specifics of breaches and nuisance issues are addressed in detail. And appendix two includes the building inspection correspondence included is an email from an architect who was contracted to work on the fire safety and exiting issues and had to withdraw his services due to the deplorable conditions and concerns for his own personal health. Appendix three is correspondence from the RCMP and the type of calls that they are responding to are mentioned in the report, but routinely include assaults, assaults with weapons, disturbances, threats, sudden death from overdoses, overdose calls, drug trafficking, and sex trafficking of children and prostitution. And appendix four outlines the Port Alberni Fire Department's numerous calls for building alarms where no fires are found. Fire alarms are intentionally set off. Fire safety and fire codes are completely ignored and not working. Due to the bylaw infractions, calls requiring emergency response and impacts to public health and safety, staff recommends that council by resolution declare this, the building to be in a hazardous condition, a nuisance and so dilapidated and unclean as to be offensive to the community and impose the remedial actions as outlined. The property owner has been advised that this issue is before council today. Should council proceed with the recommended resolutions, formal notice will be provided to the owner outlining the remedial actions required and the timeline for completion. The owner will have an opportunity to appeal to council for reconsideration of the resolution by providing written notice within 14 days, the notice, the date the notice is sent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, are there any questions on this one? Councillor Paulson. I don't know if anybody can answer the question or not. Uh, once again, the the photo evidence here is it's rather damning, damning, but there's one photo in particular that's quite disturbing to me, and it's um, page two, 255 of our report. Um, it appears to me as though that door has suffered a shotgun blast, and um, the door is totally dis destroyed around the lock, 
And I would suspect that uh, all of the holes in the grouping there, I could be wrong, but indicates um, something that is um, very nefarious and very illegal that has gone on in that particular situation. I don't know if anybody can confirm that, but um, the evidence is there in a photo and it's, it's pretty damning. It's, uh, I'm shocked. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next we have Councillor Corbeil and then Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Gaylene, I should have asked you this about the, the last uh, building. Uh, how many how many suites are in the Harbor View and how many rooms are in the port pub? Uh, in the Harbor View, I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe there's about 20 um, and uh, port pubs, there's 40. Thank you. And Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This isn't a question, it's a comment, but I hope that other owners of buildings that are in this kind of condition, I hope this is a wake up call because you're going to be next. We're not gonna put up with this kind of uh, action anymore in our community. So be forewarned. Thank you very much. Councillor Solda. Yeah, uh, Madam Mayor, I know the police were out there this weekend and it's really bad you know like there's a new business under in, a restaurant that just opened up underneath there again reopened how do they move forward right with all this action that's happening outside their doors as in the alley as well as in um upstairs and it's really disappointing it's close to the main tour one of the main tourist air areas uh, again slum landlord lives out of town who cares but we do, so I'm glad we're moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, and I can tell you from you know the time that I spend in the area at my business, the police are there every day, um, often many times a day. They are they are there every day, um, and just on Saturday, the fire department was outside of the Harbor View um, with hoses for what was obviously a false alarm. Um, so you know. Aside from the very clear safety issues and just the devastating conditions that we can see people are living in, um, it is absolutely, you know, a huge drain on our resources, fire, police, bylaw, um, you know, general just city staff from the complaints that we get and the calls that we get and very challenging for um, building owners and business owners that and residents that that live around these buildings. So. Um, I absolutely echo your comments, Councillor Solda. Were there any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read this one? Well, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, I move that the council pursuant to section 72 and 73 of the community charter considers that the property at 5170 Argyle Street and having a legal description of lot 24, block 86, DL1, ALD, PL, VIP 197, and lot 23, block 86, DL1, ALD, PL, VIP 197, better known as the property, is on, is an unsafe condition and that the structure on the property the structure contravenes the BC Building Code and the Port Alberni Building Standards Bylaw number 4975, 2018. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Second. Councillor Poon. Any comments on this one? Seeing none, all in favor. None opposed, carried. We'll go on to the second one. And two, that the council pursuant to section 72 and 74 of the community charter declares that the structure and the discarded materials and refuse about the structure on the property are a nuisance and are so dilapidated and unclean as to be uh, offensive to the community. Seconder for this one. Seconded by Second. Councilor Poon. Seeing no questions or comments, all in favor? None opposed, carried. And thirdly, and further, that council pursuant to section 72, 73, 74 of the community charter resolves that 
A8899 Holdings Limited, the registered owner of the property is hereby required to carry out the following work within 30 days of the date that notice of this resolution is sent to the owner. One, repair the exterior walls of the structure, including coping and flashing to restore the integrity of the building envelope to a condition sufficient to protect the structure from the weather and from infestations of insects, rodents, and other pests, including without limitation by A, remediating any holes, breaks, loose or rotting boards or timbers, and any other conditions which might permit the entry of insects, rodents, or other pests to the interior of the walls or the interior of the structure, and B, applying paint, stain, or other protective coatings to the exterior walls so as to adequately protect them against deteriorations. Two, remove or permanently cover all graffiti from the exterior of the structure. Three, replace all broken or missing hand railings on staircases. Four, replace all broken, cracked, or otherwise compromised exterior windows to a weather-tight condition which operates to provide light and ventilation. Five, replace or repair all damaged, decayed, or deteriorated window sashes, window frames, and casings. Six, replace or repair all exterior doors of the structure so that they are weather tight, operational, fit tightly within their frames when closed, and locked so as to prevent entry with at least one entrance door capable of being locked from both inside and outside. Seven, replace or repair all interior entrance doors and door frames for each unit and provide locking door knobs. Eight, replace or repair the roof of the structure to a weather tight condition with no leaks. Nine, an engineer or architect must attend, inspect and sign off on the replacement and repair of the fire safety and exit issues. 10, replace or repair all fire escapes and stairs to a safe and clean condition free from rot, holes, cracks, excessive wear, and warping or hazardous obstructions. 11, have licensed electricians inspect and repair all electrical. 12, have a licensed plumber repair the communal washroom on the second floor, repair communal shower, hot water tank and washrooms on the first floor. 13, replace or repair all fire protection systems, heat detections, smoke detections, fire alarms, fire extinguishers, sprinkler systems, exit signs, emergency lighting, fire separations and means of egress required by the BC building code and the BC fire code to a functional and unobstructive condition. 14, remove and properly dispose of all refuse from the interior and exterior common spaces of the property, including food waste, combustibles, non-combustibles, furniture, appliances, tires, construction waste, stripped or wrecked automobiles, trucks, trailers, boats, vehicles, vessels, or machinery, parts or components of any of the aforementioned to an appropriate disposal site. 15, designate a space or area for daily refuse on premises and not in emergency egress areas. 16, eliminate all rodents, vermin, and insects from the structure. 17, permanently remove all objects placed, stored, or maintained upon any hallways or entranceway which may interfere with access or egress to or from the building in case of fire or other emergency, including all access areas on the property and prepare a fire safety plan in cooperation with Port Alberni Fire Department. Thank you, is there a seconder for that one? Seconded by Councillor Washington. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor. None opposed, carried. And item four. Compliance and reconsideration notice, time limit recommendations, and further that the council pursuant to section 78 of the community charter directs staff to advise the owner that the owner may request that council reconsider this resolution by providing written notice within 14 days of the date on which notice of the remedial action requirement was sent to the owner. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon, seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried and fifth. Uh, 
municipal action at defaulter's expense. And further, that council pursuant to section 17 of the community charter authorizes city staff to carry out any required any requirements set out in paragraph two of this resolution, which the owner fails to complete within the time permitted by this resolution and to recover the cost of carrying out such requirement from the owner as a debt. Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded by yeah. Councillor Solda. Any final questions or comments? Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to ensure that staff follows the 30 day guideline and don't accept any sob stories for these two, both of these owners of these two files. If it's day 31 and they haven't done anything, we go in there and we move on it right away. Thank you. Thank you, Gaylene. Are you able to just comment on what um, the process will be? And of course, there is a formal um, appeal process, of course, for the 14 days, but if the work is not completed in 30 days, um, what is our next step as a city? Then it would go to tender, but we would probably have more discussions with staff in our next direction. Great, thank you. Councillor Solda. Well, maybe we could ask the owners, move in and see what it's like. Why not? Thank you for that. Okay, so on the motion, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Okay, thank you very much, Gaylene. Okay, we've done item 10. So moving on to item 11 on our agenda from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage, relamping the multiplex. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the city owned Alberni Valley multiplex built in 2000 contains two ice sheets. Lighting in the warehouser rink was upgraded in 2008 to accommodate the television broadcast standards of the 2009 World Under 17 Hockey Challenge and lighting in the Colson rink uh, is original to the facility. So in the 2018 to 22 uh, five-year financial plan, $100,000 was included to replace the lights and the ballast on the warehouser rink in 2019 with funds coming from the Carbon Trust. During the 2020 budget process, council will be reminded that staff indicated the project would be explored in 2021. And since that 2020 budget process, staff confirmed that replacement light fixtures for the Colson rink are no longer available, resulting in the lighting system on the Colson rink requiring replacement in 2021. So I've got three options for council's consideration this afternoon. The first being that council amend the five-year financial plan to replace the lighting systems in both Warehouser and Colson rinks in 2021 at a cost of $330,000. Number two, that council uh, directs staff to replace the lighting system strictly on the Colson rink in 2021 at a cost of $180,000. Or thirdly, that council uh, not replace any lighting systems at this time. Thank you. Are there questions from council? Councillor Solda. So just let me clarify this, um, get it clarified. So this is a budget item for next, for next year. Is that correct? Uh, so Madam Mayor, uh, in the event that uh, that council does does approve the amendment and direct staff to move forward, we would then proceed with an RFP process, and I would then return to council at a later date uh, for confirmation moving forward in in 2021 after that uh, RFP process. So my question still is: Is this in the budget for 2021? Yes, so under on page 348 under implications, uh, it would be I'd be requesting early approval for a 2021 expenditure. So for this year, is that correct? This coming the year. Expenditure is in 2021. Okay, um, it's just that I have concerns because we don't know what the future is going to hold. We don't know if we're going to have a second closing or anything. I mean, if it. So that's my only qualm. Just have to convince me at this moment. Okay, thanks. So I think what I'm understanding is, first of all, um, this we would see this again, um, but that a piece of this is coming from the Carbon Trust and the other piece of it would be from the Parks and Recreation Reserve Fund, which in my opinion is exactly what that fund is for and whether there is a second closing or not. Um, and certainly that is you know, a possibility that we all hope to avoid, um, but we still, you know, we still wanna maintain our assets and we still wanna make sure that um, of course, we're being as carbon efficient as possible. So uh, my understanding is this is that's kind of what this is about. Um, and although it's coming from 2021 budget, um, it would be coming out of reserves where which are kind of for that anyways. So um, Councillor Poon and then Councillor Haggard. 
Thank you. Uh, I just don't understand what what are the implications if if we choose option three and do nothing at this time. So, Madam Mayor, on, on page 348 of your agenda package, just in the third paragraph of implications. Um, so I, I've outlined there that in the event that we choose not to replace any of the lighting systems on either rink. So at this stage, as I mentioned, with the Colson rink uh, not offering, we cannot get replacement parts uh, for those, those lighting systems, so the fixtures or the ballasts. Each of the 43 fixtures to replace one at a time would come at a cost of approximately $700 each. And then in addition, since it's not the same fixture or ballast, um, we're not sure at this stage how, what the variance would be with the light that is cast from the new lights. So meaning that the color temperature or how the light is projected, as well as how the light is cast onto the surface, we'll start to get essentially a patchwork approach that it will not be consistent. Um, at this stage, since we're not exploring uh, televised events, that sort of thing, it's not such a concern. But again, with the uncertain nature and the exorbitant cost per fixture, uh, we recommend that we move forward with a full replacement. Thank you. Um, Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I understand we put the lights at close and rink, but I couldn't quite understand what would be the advantage of doing both rink at the same time. So my point is, if you could do one now and one later, would that be an option? Or what's the advantage or disadvantages of that? Absolutely. So again, Madam Mayor, on page 348 of the agenda under implications there. So it, it indicates sort of the process, the, the first paragraph outlines uh, in the event we replace both uh, surfaces, what that impact would be. And, and again, the RFP process. The second paragraph there, if we're looking at just the Colson rink, there's a possibility that uh, the technology may change. So um, if we if we aim to replace both at the same time, what we would what we can do in that case is what we call future proofing. So the ability for both sheets to work off of a single uh, mechanism or single computer. So then that way we know with those that that each surface will work properly or in conjunction with each other. Whereas there's a chance, again, it's, it's really difficult to know how fast technology moves with, uh, with light. So to give you context, again, in the 20 years since we installed the Colson light system to today, we can't even get those parts anymore. So it's not just talking about it's expensive to get replacement parts, they just don't exist. So in the event that we elect not to replace Weyerhaeuser, there isn't a chance there that it would require additional uh, infrastructure in the future or a secondary uh, mechanism or computer to light. And so essentially the two surfaces may not talk to each other or, or communicate that way, um, but it would not be a detriment to, to run the lights themselves. There's just a chance at, at uh, a cost that we're not quite sure at this stage what it might look like down the road to operate both facilities separately. Do you think there would be a cost advantage if you got, if it sent out an RFP to do both sides at the same time then? Absolutely. So Madam Mayor, the most efficient approach and, and staff's recommendation would be to replace both because the only way we can be certain that the technology will be compatible is if we replace both at the same time. Thank you. Councillor Paulson. Um, do you have any thoughts on, I, I gather that the new lighting systems would be um, conversion to LED systems. The um, Colson rink is already a, a type of uh, LED system, but do we have any idea what the payback would be on um, uh, power savings? Uh, the other advantage of LED lighting is you can, they're instant on and off. Um, you can operate them at different lighting levels, in particular for special events. And it does, doesn't have to be figure skating. It can be uh, a conference or whatever, but um, just wondering what the payback period would be and switching to LEDs and, um, and certainly the advantages of instant on and off. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Madam Mayor, further to page 348 there, there's the, the two columns. So it speaks to immediate need as well as considerations. Considerations, of course, are when we get into the fun uh, projection lighting and all sorts of the, the wants we would love to have, but, have, but not necessarily the needs. And uh, so future considerations there. To Councillor Paulson's point, uh, the ability with LEDs as well to be able to turn lights instantly on and off doesn't sound tricky when we're thinking about someone's residence, but when we're trying to get metal halides or other fixtures 
uh, active, it takes, it can take 10 to 15 minutes to turn the lights on. So you can imagine in the middle of an event, uh, very difficult to run an event when everyone's literally in the dark waiting for the lights to warm up or, or cool off enough that they can warm up and uh, turn on again. Uh, specifically around cost savings and long term, we're, we've reached out to BC Hydro, so we're currently working with them right now. We've identified in the staff report that we're predicting a savings of about $16,000 specifically with uh, looking at replacing both both rings. We're also having ongoing conversations with those folks around what would that payback or, or replacement cost, how long would it take us to, to pay for those lighting systems. So we're still waiting for feedback on that specifically. Thank you. Councillor Paulson, go ahead. Just um, sitting here kind of musing, um, Parksville made this change probably about six years ago, I think, for both of their rinks. Um, could we reach out to um, uh, Oceanside Place just to get their feedback on, um, on, uh, on their lighting system, the pros and cons of what they've done, and also get a, a feeling for their cost savings over the years? Yeah, and, and Madam Mayor, the, the folks that we're working with um, as potential suppliers as well, they of course, um, there's not too, too many suppliers of this type of system. So meaning that they also keep in very close contact with, with rinks. Uh, we know that recreation is a fairly small world. And so of course, as part of our, our diligence, we would be reaching out to other facilities, see what's working also in industry as well um, to ensure that we're getting the best value we can. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none, would anybody like to make a motion? Of course, we have um, the suggested motion written in the um, agenda. And of course, council always has the option of going a different direction if they choose. Councillor Paulson. I'll read the motion. I'd like to move that uh, the council authorized staff to amend the city's five-year financial plan bylaw 2020 to 2024 bylaw number 5003 for the purpose of identifying funds for the replacement of the lighting systems at both ranks within the multiplex at an estimated cost of $330,000 in the 2021 calendar year with $100,000 coming from Carbon Trust and $230,000 coming from the Parks and Recreation Reserve Fund. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. And any further discussion? Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The the extra money the that is coming from the Parks and Rec. Um, sorry, uh, the Reserve Fund. That's that's what the Reserve Fund is there for, isn't it? Not. It, it won't be another more bearing to the taxpayer. Just coming out of the reserves. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Councillor Solda and then Councillor Corbeil. So how much will that leave us left in our reserve fund? Uh, Madam Mayor, I understand and, and uh, the Director of Finance can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe we have over $2.5 million in reserve at this stage. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corbiel. Just wondering, what's the uh, life expectancy of these uh, new lights? Madam Mayor, it would depend uh, the specifics. Of course, the again, these are estimated costs or, or figures based on before going to RFP. So you can appreciate that uh, suppliers won't give us a, a, a very fine pencil uh, point number until we go to RFP. Uh, so that will be a consideration we can uh, bring back to council when we go through the RFP process uh, before council approves the uh, the RFP at that time or, or confirms the award. Council is more than welcome to uh, review at that point what our expected lifespan would be. Thank you very much. Okay, we have the motion as written, uh, moved and seconded. Are there any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Any opposed? Carried, thank you very much. And moving on to item 12 from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage, we have reopening the Aquatic Center.
Thank you, Madam Mayor. So in March of 2020, Council will be reminded that the city-owned Echo Aquatic Centre was closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The city's five-year financial plan was amended to reflect a longer than usual summer closure with the expectation that the Aquatic Centre would reopen as usual in September. Due to concerns regarding the operational changes that must be implemented due to COVID-19 and the resulting financial projections for the Parks, Recreation and Heritage Department, the Aquatic Centre has remained closed until Council has the opportunity to consider the operating model for the remainder of 2020. So three options for Council's consideration this afternoon. The first would be that Council directs staff to open the Aquatic Centre in October of 2020. That Council would direct staff to keep the Aquatic Centre closed through the remainder of 2020. And thirdly, that Council for the, for the City of Port Alberni would provide alternate direction to staff. And just to note that should Council direct staff to open the Aquatic Centre, staff would be thrilled to safely welcome all participants and guests back October the 1st. Thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Solda first. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I noticed um, some of the uh, pools are opening up in Vancouver area and some aren't. So I'm just curious to know, have we checked in with them and see just to see how they're doing and what's happening there? I don't think we should keep the pool closed permanently because there's a lot of people that really need to have that um, motion in the water because it's easier on their limbs than that. So I'm just kind of curious to know. Yeah, so Madam Mayor, okay. I participate with my colleagues on a variety of weekly conference calls. So there's a Vancouver Island group that gets together. There are province-wide directors, about 60 of us that get together every week. Um, there's a small town uh, confab that I'm, I'm able to be part of as well. So yes, I'm very familiar with what, what other communities are doing. Uh, we're, we're all, of course, in, in similar situations, but different municipalities and communities have different funding models as well. And so each has taken a different approach to how they wish to look at reopening. Some facilities, uh, their, their communities have determined that they're unable to move forward. In the case of this report that I've presented this afternoon, uh, there is a, a suggestion or a recommendation that staff would come back in the fall uh, should council wish to reopen now, come back in the fall with some options uh, to be sustainable to remain open in 2021, which may uh, we may need to consider a different operating model than we're currently under. But again, to be able to provide some options that we would have the capability to open now and then look to how we can sustain to remain open in 2021. And uh, yes, I am in close contact with uh, with my colleagues. Thank you, Willa. Other questions from council? Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, going to the pool is not something that I would do right now, but I under, I know that the staff would take every precaution that they possibly can to keep it safe. And I do know there's a lot of people who do depend on the pool for physical re rehabilitation, um, but uh, you do show a small surplus now until the end of the year. And as you mentioned, you, you, in 2021 may look at different models, but I'm kind of concerned about the whole picture of parks and recreation, because I think that the multiplex, the revenues aren't gonna be there as we are projected, those revenues are gonna be down. I know some um, teams are not gonna be renting the ice like they used to. Uh, public skating, I, I saw an ad in the paper, you're limited to 25 people. So then you're not gonna be selling as much at the concession stand. So all those revenues are gonna be down as well. Uh, I would support reopening the pool, but maybe could we look at reopening it at uh, shorter hours than what we're used to and try and keep ahead of the surplus a little bit before the end of the year. Just a thought. Madam Mayor, if I may, uh, of course, it's it's council's prerogative. However, you wish your your aquatic center to to open. Of course, staff will oblige, and we're happy to to adjust as needed. The numbers that I've indicated on page three hundred and fifty one. So uh, there's a small chart there uh, that Councillor Haggard uh, reminded us of the small surplus there. So I've worked very closely with the director of finance, and we've been very conservative on our numbers. So when we consider budgeting in future. Um, my, my recommendation would be that we're looking at 100% of expenses and potentially only 25% of our revenues. And so what that means is that currently we're being very conservative with our numbers because we're, of course, until we open facilities, we really don't know what the participation will actually iron out to be. And then also moving forward again, being prudent operators to be able to come to council with 
a variety of scenarios rather than saying we're either going to open as we normally would uh, pre-COVID or we're not going to open at all. I think part of being a prudent operator is that we explore all of the opportunities there so that if there's an opportunity for us to open, we want to do that. Of course, as I mentioned at the top of page 351, safety is not a concern. I, I feel very confident that we're following all of the provincial guidelines and uh, expectations. So like I say, staff would be thrilled to welcome folks back. This is not a conversation around safety at all. It's really about how council would like to see uh, your financial plan play out and again the numbers as indicated on page 351 are based under the assumption or, or under the operating model that we would have the same hours of operations that we did prior to closing in March uh, 2020. Thank you for that and thanks for the comments around safety as well um, it is it's good to know that um, staff is confident um, in being able to keep obviously our staff and and certainly members of the public safe in in the pool as well that's um, you know a, a top priority so appreciate the confidence there it makes the decision a lot easier i have councillor washington and then councillor poon and i think councillor paulson thank you madam mayor um just a question for director thorpe for our for our people watching when you say the aquatic center, are you meaning just the swimming pool or do you mean the weight room and the hot tub and all the other amenities that are at the center, open the center up completely or just opening up the pool? That's a great question. So when I'm referring to the aquatic center, we talk about the natatorium, which is the wet part of a, a swimming pool facility, as well as the fitness uh, center, the saunas, uh, the hot tubs as well. So. Uh, going back to the safety component, uh, if council directed staff to reopen the aquatic center, we would actually maintain the, the sauna as well as the hot tub would remain closed at this stage following the provincial guidelines. So based on the particulates in the air or the aerosols, there's concern there that being in, in that extreme environment of a sauna or of a hot tub is not advisable uh, to open at this stage. And then the fitness center, we would, similar to to Councillor Haggard's point around public skating and, and maximum numbers, we would have uh, a maximum number of, I believe it is two participants in the fitness studio. And then though you would sign up for a time slot. So we wouldn't have this onslaught of guests coming in uh, and, and inundating the facility per se. You would sign up for a specific slot and then you'd be able to enjoy the fit fitness studio that way. So uh, the short answer to that question is the main, uh, the main basin or the main pool, the shallow end and deep end, and the top pool would open. Um, though, and then the, the hot tub and the sauna would be closed and then the, the fitness center would be open as well. And then of course we would have some specifics uh, with folks and we would educate the community on how do I participate? How do I sign up? How do I um, navigate the facility? So we'd ensure that before we open, community's comfortable and can feel confident in the process. So there's no confusion when folks arrive at the facility. Thank you. Councillor Poon. Thank you. Um, at first, I was very uh, concerned, very hesitant uh, to uh, look at reopening this, but um, I think Director Thorpe has provided a lot of confidence and, uh, and I'm happy with the precautions that are being taken, especially uh, with regards to uh, keeping the sauna and the hot tub closed. And uh, yeah, I think I would support reopening too. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Paulson. Uh, just once again, uh, thank you for to Director Thorpe for reassuring us on the on the compliance with the safety issues, uh, there is a there is a an uptick in um, in COVID right now as we speak in the province and probably across North America. And um, would we be prepared to um, respond fairly quickly if um, if the provincial government was to go backwards a bit and, and shut some of these facilities down? if for no other reason for a short period of time? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, much like when, when we navigated the first two weeks in March that we, we, we weren't quite sure as, as the guidelines came out um, from Dr. Bounty Henry's office and the, pro, and the provincial, the different directives, um, staff were able to be quite nimble and be um, sort of keep facilities open or, sh or shut down as required on a fairly 
a brisk pace as far as the ability to, if we needed to sort of press pause and, and limit uh, operating hours, we were able to do that in the event that we needed to, for instance, drain pools or that sort of thing and refill, those are all options for us. So I will remind council that of course, we're in a in a 53 year old facility. So uh, which we would still put toe to toe against any facility half its age. It's in, in fantastic condition, it's very clean. Um, but, but yes, Madam Mayor, we would have the ability to respond should uh, the province change guidelines and, and as they evolve. Again, I'm, I'm in close contact with my colleagues and the province about what those guidelines are to shift and staff do have the capacity to respond where, wherever required to make adjustments, hopefully in a, in a positive direction, meaning we're able to increase capacity in the event that we need to revert the other direction. Of course, we're, we're happy to do that as well. Thank you for that. Councillor Corbeil. Uh, Councillor Paulson asked my question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Excellent. Any other questions from Council? Okay. Um, Councillor Paulson, would you like to um, read the motion or, of course, uh, make an alternate one if you wish? No, I like the motion. Uh, I'd like to move that uh, Council direct staff to reopen Echo 67 Aquatic Centre in October 2020 following all required public health guidelines and facility safety plans. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, so moved and seconded, seeing no final comments, all in favor. Any opposed? Carried. Thank you very much, Willa. And moving on to bylaws, item one from the manager of planning, the official community plan and zoning bylaw amendments. Hello, thank you. Perfect, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so before you for consideration, uh, our third reading and final adoption of the official community plan and zoning bylaw amendments for 5269 Pineo Road. So an application has been made to amend the official community plan and zoning bylaw to rezone 5269 Pineo Road from RR2 semi-rural residential zone to the RM2 medium density uh, multiple family residential zone and to change the land use designation uh, from residential to multifamily residential. And as part of this, the property would also be located within development permit area number one, multifamily residential uh, for the form and character of the property. So the purpose of the application is to facilitate the construction of a small second principal dwelling unit on the subject property, which would provide accommodations for a family member. Uh, the proposed land use meets the strategic objectives of the official community plan uh, by helping provide a diverse range of housing options with a predominantly, within a predominantly single family neighborhood. The development permit process would ensure that the style of the development is compatible with the neighborhood form and character. So most recently, a public hearing was held on August 10th, uh, 2020, and all conditions have been met uh, and the applicant has requested that council give third reading and final consideration of the bylaws. Uh, the planning department supports amending the official community plan uh, bylaw and the zoning bylaw for this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions on this one? Okay. Um, all right, would somebody like to read the first, actually I'll go to Councillor Solda for these ones. And there's a number of motions there. All right, Madam Mayor. I move that the report of the public hearing held August 10th, 2020 regarding bylaw numbers 5006 and 5007 be received. Second, Madam Mayor. Moved and seconded, seeing no comments. All in favor? Carried. And go ahead, Councillor Solda. I'll move that the community plan amendment number 35269 Pino Road Murphy bylaw number 5006 be read a third time. Second, Madam Mayor. Moved and seconded. Seeing no questions, all in favor? Carried. I'll move that the official community plan amendment number 30, 5269 Pino Road, Murphy bylaw number 5006 be now finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, sealed with the corporate seal and numbered 5006. Second, Madam Mayor. Sure. You moved and seconded. All in favor? Carried. I'll move that the zoning amendment number number 39, 5269 Pena Road, Murphy, 
bylaw number 5007 be read a third time. Second, Madam Mayor. Moved and seconded. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you. And the last one. And finally, I move that the zoning bylaw amendment number 39-5269 Pino Road, Murphy, bylaw number 5007 be now finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, sealed with the corporate seal and numbered 5007. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you very much. And moving on to item two from the manager of planning, official community plan and zoning, zoning bylaw amendments for 2170 Mallory Drive. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So before you for consideration is third reading of the official community plan uh, amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for 2170 Mallory Drive. So the proposed bylaw amendments would change the zoning from P1 institutional to M1 light industry. Uh, and the designation of the property would be changed from residential to industrial on the official community plan. And the property would be included in development permit area number three industrial, uh, again, for the form and character of the property. The purpose of the amendments uh, is to expand the industrial uses permitted on the subject property in order to secure a new tenant or a new uh, owner for the property. No specific use or development plan uh, for the property has been identified at this point um, by the applicant. A public hearing was held on September 8th, 2020. In addition to uh, the required public hearing, correspondence was also forwarded to, uh, to Shop First Nation regarding the proposed bylaw amendments. All conditions have been met by the applicant and uh, a restrictive covenant uh, that was on the registered to title on the property has been discharged uh, from the property title as well. So there are currently no plans to demolish, alter, or redevelop the existing building on the site. So at this point, no development permit um, is required. Um, however, staff uh, seem to understand that there is a potential purchase deal being finalized at the moment, uh, and that the potential purchaser is in, interested in retaining um, the institutional zone. So since the applicant has requested uh, that council continue to give further consideration of the bylaws, staff are recommending that Council proceed with third reading of the bylaws at this point uh, to allow the application to be further discussed uh, subsequent to the public hearing, uh, while also um, potentially allowing some time for the purchaser to secure ownership of the property with the current regulations in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, are there questions on this one? Councillor Poon. Thank you. Uh, so just so I'm clear, there's still an opportunity for council to give input on this property, um, even like in terms of uh, development permits, right? Thank you. Uh, yes, through Madam Mayor, uh, that would be correct. So there would still be a required final reading of the bylaws. And then if council chose to approve those bylaws uh, at a future date, then there would be a development permit process that would uh, regulate the form and character of the property. Absolutely. Other questions? Councillor Corbiel. Yeah, I'm just curious, Caitlin, what was the restrictive covenant that was removed? Yes, thank you. Uh, the restrictive covenant was just uh, basically uh, ensuring that there would be uh, uh, sewer connections, I believe, um, made to the property. Um, in order for uh, future building to be permitted. So it was kind of a no build covenant uh, and those connections have now been uh, made and facilitated to the property. So the covenant has been discharged. Thank you. Um, I will just add to this one that I feel uncomfortable. Um, I feel uncomfortable moving toward a, um, even though it is just third reading today, moving toward a light industrial zoning on a property that is potentially um, potentially sold. Uh, we had a public hearing where the applicant, um, you know, made a lot of indications of what they were and were not going to do on the property in the time that they owned it. And um, I think those representations were important to the people who attended that public hearing and certainly to me, um, you know, they give some comfort for what it, the property is going to be used for and what it's not going to be used for. And I feel quite uncomfortable um, moving forward with this today, 
um, when next week it could be owned by a different app, a different proponent um, who could then have a whole list of things that they are able to do with it um, because we, you know, are, are approving this zoning. So um, I, I see we have, you know, receipt of public hearing, um, receipt of the report from the public hearing, and I'm comfortable moving forward with that. But on the rest of it, even though it is just third reading, I wonder how council would feel about deferring this until our next meeting um, to see what happens if the sale goes through. And if it does, we can probably have a, um, a bigger conversation about, about what's going, going on. Or if it doesn't go through, um, we could move forward with the comfort of um, you know, the indications we were, we were given by the current property owner. Councillor Solda. Madam Mayor, I would agree with you. I have no problem with the first to accept the public hearing. Um, plus, when a new owner takes over, how do we know they're going to say, hey, we're not going to do this? That's not good enough. The handshake thing is all gone now. It's all got to be in writing. So, yeah, and, and so, um, and that's exactly how I feel. And um, I certainly have confidence, um, you know, and, and somewhat of a level of trust in the in the current owners as being good um, community members and, and business owners. Um, and in a small town, we often have the privilege of, of knowing who we're doing business in with, and that gives comfort. Um, but when a property is, is pending a sale and we're considering a large change like this, um, I think it's important to, to, to be able to have a bit more information before. So, um, my understanding and, and maybe the planner could just, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is, um, Kind of thinking this out in my out loud. Um, if the prop, if the sale were to fall through, we delay this and come right back to the same motion, um, and we we can pass it and continue to move forward. Um, nothing will have changed. If the proper, if the sale does go through, and we would like more information from the property, the new property owner about their intentions for the property. Um, if they wanted to proceed, I would imagine that would trigger the need for a new public hearing because we'd be receiving new information. If we wanted to get more information from the new owner, we would likely need a new public hearing, which might be irrelevant because they might, it sounds like they don't want the rezoning anyways, potentially. <laughs> so yes, Madam Mayor, that, that is correct. If there was a, a change in the, in the property, um, that would be considered new information and therefore uh, a public hearing, a, a second public hearing would be um, required and we can't waive that public hearing because an OCP amendment is, uh, is required with this application. Uh, okay. That being said, uh, from all my understandings, and I don't think I unfortunately can uh, be public with who that potential purchaser is at this point, just because it's, um, I guess, private information, but they, yep. their intent is fully not to proceed with the, the rezoning. Um, so in, in some ways reading, uh, the city controls the process uh, in terms of uh, the, the steps and the approvals. Uh, so giving third reading at this point um, doesn't hurt the current applicant. It, it enables them to, con to continue to move forward um, and council to then um, give further consideration based on whether or not that, that sale is, uh, is goes through. Thank you. So um, I think um, I, I completely hear you on third reading. I know third reading isn't passing it, but I think third reading is a really strong indication that it will be passed. So I would prefer um, if we we handle the report on the public hearing um, and then um, I would like to defer until our next meeting to see if there is, you know, potentially more information to come through. If not, we will come right back to this and we can go back to third reading. So. Um, that's what I'm going to suggest, but let's start with um, the, I'll move that the report from the public hearing held September 8th, 2020 regarding bylaws number 5009, 5010 and 5011 be received. Second, Second Madam Mayor. Moved and seconded. Any comments on that? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you. And then I'm going to move that we defer um, the third reading to come back at the next meeting, regular meeting of council. Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon. Any comments um, or concerns on this from council? Okay, seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? None opposed. Oh, possibly opposed. <laughs> Thank you very much, carried.
Okay, um, thank you for that, Caitlin. Um, moving on to item three, we have the Manager of Planning, Advisory Planning Commission, proposed zoning bylaw amendment for faithful construction. Perfect, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, so before you for consideration today is first and second reading of zoning bylaw amendments for 5381 Fall Street, as well as a procedural question with regards to the public hearing. Um, so the city has received an application to rezone 5381 Fall Street from R1 single family residential to R2 one and two family residential. No amendments to the official community plan are required. The purpose of the amendments would facilitate the conversion of a single family dwelling into a duplex. Uh, so the, the size of the proposed second dwelling unit uh, is, is simply too large to be classified as a secondary suite and therefore uh, a zoning bylaw amendment is required to classify uh, the property as a duplex. The Advisory Planning Commission uh, has reviewed the rezoning application uh, at their August meeting and recommended that City Council proceed uh, with the zoning bylaw amendments. If City Council proceeds with first and second reading of the zoning bylaw, the next step is, uh, is to uh, proceed to uh, either a public hearing or to uh, waive the public hearing requirement and, uh, and give public notice in advance of third and final reading of the bylaw amendments. So since there's no proposed amendment to the official community plan, uh, this development uh, application is eligible to proceed by way of waiving the public hearing and proceeding with public notice process. And given the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, staff are recommending that city council utilize this process outlined in section 4642 uh, and section 467 of the Local Government Act to waive the public hearing requirement for this application and proceed with giving public notice and public hearing, uh, that the public hearing be waived, sorry. Uh, so no in-person meeting would be required, uh, but there would still be an opportunity for the public to inspect the bylaw amendments and to provide input to council in the form of a written letter or email. So there are three options for council to consider today. The first is to proceed with the bylaw amendments and direct staff to give notice uh, to waive the public hearing. The second is to proceed with the bylaw amendment and direct staff to proceed with scheduling a public hearing. Uh, and the third option is to provide alternative direction. So the planning department uh, supports the proposed zoning bylaw amendment because allowing two family uh, use at the subject property aligns well with the OCP um, because it encourages a variety of housing options for residents within the community and again uh, helps diversify housing options within a single family home neighborhood. City Council uh, should consider whether or not the proposed amendments is appropriate for the site and how this change might impact the immediate neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Seeing no questions, Councillor Haggard, would you like to read the motions? I move that Sony map amendment number 41, 5381 Falls Street, faithful construction bylaw number 5014 be now introduced and read a first time. Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Solda. Seeing no questions or comments, all in favor. Carried, thank you. And if you wanna continue. I move that Sony map amendment number 41, 5381 Falls Street, faithful construction, bylaw number 5014 be read a second time. Second. Okay, moved and seconded by Councillor Haggard and Councillor Poon. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor carried. I move that City Council waive the public hearing requirement for proposed zoning map amendment number 41, 5381 Fall Street, faithful construction, bylaw number 5014 in accordance with section 4642 of the Local Government Act and provide public notice in accordance with section 467 of the LGA prior to consideration of third reading and final adoption of the bylaw. Thank you, is there Second. a seconded by Councillor Poon and seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried, thank you. 
Council, we are at 4.55, uh, so we're almost um, three hours, so we will need a motion to continue. I'm catching it before Councillor Washington can remind me. And um, I'm also thinking that we should maybe take a maybe five minute break since um, in case anyone wants a glass of water or anything since we've been going for a while and we have quite a few pages left in this agenda. So um, could we have a motion to continue our meeting so beyond three, hour, three hours? Moved by Councillor Poon, seconded by Councillor Washington. And a All break, please. <laughs> and a break. All in favor. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Council, we will resume at um, 5 p.m. on the dot. Thank you. Okay. I think that is everyone. Uh, so we will move on to item four from the manager of planning, proposed zoning bylaw amendments for 4202 and 4238. 8th Avenue. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. So before you for consideration is a uh, procedural question with regards to zoning bylaw amendments for 4202 and 4238 38th Avenue. Uh, so zoning bylaw amendments for these properties are currently being considered. The purpose of the amendments is to rezone the subject properties from RM1 low density multifamily res residential to, uh, to RM3 high density multiple family residential zone and to permit a site specific text amendment that would increase the number of stories to five uh, and increase the maximum building height to 18 meters. So most recently at the July 27th uh, regular council meeting, city council removed uh, a lot consolidation condition uh, and public notice was given to waive the public hearing. However, since then, staff have identified a procedural error that needs to be corrected. So third reading of the bylaw was previously given uh, last year by City Council back in se September 2019, um, which should have been rescinded at the July 27th, 2020 meeting. In order to correct this error, third reading must be rescinded in order to then proceed with waiving the public hearing uh, a second time before considering the bylaws a final time at an upcoming September 28th. 2020 meeting. Uh, staff also recommend that City Council again utilize uh, the authorized process outlined in Section 4642 and Section 467 of the Local Government Act to waive the public hearing requirement for this application and to proceed with giving public notice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions from Council on this? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Washington, would you like to read the motions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I move that third reading of the zoning bylaw map amendment number 35, 4202 and 4238 8th Avenue to build bylaw number 4993 be rescinded. <clears throat> Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Solda. Any questions on this? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you. If you wanna continue. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The, the third reading of the zoning text amendment number T22, site-specific uses, RM3, high density multiple family residential, bylaw number 4994 be rescinded. Sec seconded by Councillor Solda. Seeing no comments, all in favor. Carried. And that the city <clears throat> council waived the public hearing requirement for the proposed zoning bylaw map amendment number 35, 4202 and 4235 8th Avenue to Bell, bylaw number 4993 in accordance with the section 4642 of the Local Government Act, LGA and provide the public with notice of in, in accordance with section 467 of the LGA prior to consideration of further readings of the bylaw. Thank Second. you. Seconded by Councillor Poon. Any questions? Uh, the only question I have um, for the manager of planning is if we have any indication of um, if this development is, is planning to move forward. Um, and I only ask because when we had the public hearing, they were a little bit wishy-washy on, um, you know, if they were moving forward or just kind of, you know, still in the planning process. It sounded like there was a couple of partners involved. And um, so just wondering if, if we've had any updates since then. 
No real updates at this point in terms of whether or not it's proceeding uh, immediately. Uh, and my indication for that is there's not a development permit application that has been submitted. Typically, when we get this close to the end of a rezoning for something like this, we would expect a development permit uh, submission um, or at least some pre-application discussions to be occurring. And, and we haven't got that yet. Um, that could certainly be, of course, just because COVID and, and things are kind of a little bit um, all over the place for many different people right now. Um, I suspect that the intent is to proceed, but I don't have any uh, specific indication of that. Sure, thank you very much for clarifying. Okay, we have the motion moved and seconded. All in favor? Carried, thank you very much. Okay, correspondence for action and item number one is a letter dated August 12th from Deborah Hamilton, co-chair of the community action team requesting the city assume the role of facilitator and guide. Questions, comments? Seeing none, <laughs> uh, we do have a, a motion to receive. Um, and I will just say that I think that this is a, an incredibly important um, group in our community. And um, I don't know that the city has the um, capacity to, to take it on and, um, and be the facilitator and, and really guide it. Um, we don't have a social planning department and, um, you know, although, and, and our staff are quite um, tasked as it is with how busy things have been. So um, I'm not sure, I don't feel like we can provide um, what they're looking for, but um, Councillor Haggard, I believe you're our current liaison. Yeah, I'm just going to make a comment. I don't think the committee is aware of how close contact that you stay in with BC Housing and how many units are actually coming to the community. Uh, even though they're not here now, they're kind of in the works or in the planning stages. So that's my only comment. And um, they are concerned about the lack of low barrier housing in the community as well. But I think that's something that we can work on without having a formal committee. Uh, my concern with this request was we there was a formal committee prior in prior years that had a paid coordinator and for some reason that fell apart and I don't know why it did or it didn't follow through, but I'm just concerned that if you tried to start it, it just wouldn't work. So I think we're better off working kind of behind the scenes as what you do constantly and really support any organization that comes through with proposals. I think it can be far more effective that way. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a good point. And I think also, um, you know, you raised that they might not be aware of some of the work that um, we are doing as a as a council. Of course, I'm leading that, but you know, it's all of council's work. And so it might be worth um, it might be worth us um, reaching out. Maybe um, you and I, Councillor Haggard, since you are since you attend the meetings and. Um, seeing if we could sit down and, and just have a conversation and, and talk about what, you know, the future might look like, recognizing that we don't have the capacity to take this over, um, but that maybe there is a path forward um, where we don't lose kind of the, um, the momentum that, that has built up in this group. I think that the work that they're doing and, and the peer engagement that they have is, is really important. So um, if council is supportive of that, then um, maybe we could amend the motion or we could read the motion um, that uh, we received the letter and, and that Councillor Haggard and, and myself reach out um, to the organizers for a meeting. So moved, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And is there a seconder? Seconded I'll by second Councillor there. Washington. Excellent, any further comments? Councillor Poon. Uh, I'd like to be included in that meeting if possible. Uh, I've sat on the uh, community action team before and I really think it's a very important part of our community uh, to educate and also, you know, promote um, destigmatization of um, addictions. Thank you. Absolutely, I think that's fine. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, on the motion, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. And item two is from the BC Restaurant and Food Service Association. Um, and I'm going to recuse myself from this one um, as I did the last time a letter um, on this came. So I'm actually not sure who the acting mayor is. Does anyone know who, if, if they are the acting mayor? Acting I'd like mayor to recuse is... myself too, actually. Okay. okay. And, and acting mayor is Councillor Solda. Wonderful. 
Okay, so um, Councillor Solda, if you're good with that, then um, I will yep. just ask to be put in the waiting room. Are we, oh, we're still there. So the rest of council. So the BC Restaurant and Foods uh, Services Association, Beverage License, BC Craft Bureau Gila and BC Wine Institute. Anybody wanna make comment or Twyla, do you want to um, just read what they want basically? Certainly. I, they are looking for, um, on behalf of the BC Restaurant and Food Services Association, the Alliance of Beverage Licensees and the BC Craft Brewers Guide, we are writing to thank you for expanding outdoor dining in your municipality. And they're asking council to consider the following. Expediting applications for businesses to winterize patios in public and private spaces to provide operators with the opportunity to capitalize on the confidence of outdoor space. They are looking to approve temporary patios for summer of 2021 now so that operators are able to plan ahead. And lastly, creating a program for designated pickup zones so that businesses can enhance contactless curbside pickup in the fall and winter months. Council, what's your pleasure? Any comments? No. Uh, Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, when this, when the orig original request came forward to Council, I was very impressed about how quickly that staff worked with our local businesses to create temporary patios. So I think we're very supportive of the small business community uh, and we'll be willing to help them out in any way that we can. So I think that um, we're supportive and I don't, not sure. I think they just want the support. So I think we just can instruct staff that if anybody comes forward with this request, to try and work them as quickly as possible. Anybody else, any other, thank you. Yes, Councillor Corbell. I'd just like to move the motion we have in front of us that the August 26th, 2020 letter from the BCRFA Alliance of Beverage Licensees, <clears throat> BC Craft Brewers Guild and BC Wine Institute requesting municipalities extend permissive licensing for restaurant, pub, bar and brewery businesses around outdoor spaces be received. And seconder. Second, second, Madam Mayor. A second by Councillor Washington. And I think it's great. I think it's, this has been great for the small businesses, small restaurants, and, um, and they're very, very happy. So call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Let's bring back the mayor. Oh, and Councillor Poon too, please. Hi, Councillor. Okay. Let me just get my screen back to normal here. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have Councillor Poon back as well? Perfect. So on to proclamations. And the first one from the Port Alberni Fire Department, Fire Prevention Officer, is a letter dated August 27th, 2020, um, requesting that Council proclaim October 46th. I'm thinking maybe October 26th, but Okay. Maybe October 6th until October 10th <laughs> um, as Fire Prevention Week in Port Alberni. Um, oh, October 4th. October 4th, I see below. Anyways, not the 46th. Would somebody like to move that motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And item two from the Recycling Council of British Columbia is an email dated August 11th, requesting that council proclaim October 19th through October 25th, 2020 to as Waste Reduction Week in Port Alberni. This Motion to concur. Thank you. Um, is there a seconder? Second. Second moment. Excellent. And I think it's great timing um, given our motion today or moving forward on the curbside compost program. All in favor. Carried, thank you. And item three from the Port Alberni Association for Community Living, um, a letter dated September 1st, 2020, requesting that council proclaim the month of October 2020 as C Community Inclusion Month in Port Alberni. 
Moved to concur by Councillor Paulson, seconded by Councillor Solda. Any comments on this one? My only comment is just, um, you know, happy to support the great work that um, PACL does in our community. All in favor? Carried. And item four from the Canadian Institute of Forestry and Resource Works Society, an email dated September 3rd, 2020. Uh, requesting that council proclaim the week of September 20th to 26th as National Forest Week in Port Alberni. Would somebody like to move this? So moved. Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And correspondence for information. Um, City Clerk, would you like to read these out? Our city clerk has left. <laughs> I will read them out. Item one from Elections BC. We have a letter dated August 26, 2020, advising of the next provincial general election and the development of protocols to safely administer voting during COVID-19 pandemic. And item two from Minister Claire Trevena, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, um, which is a letter received August 18th, 2020 from Minister Claire Trevena providing an update on the recent announcements of federal and provincial funding, support for municipalities and transit services across Canada. Does anyone have any questions or comments on these? Councillor Solda. Regarding the, um, the uh, Transport Canada letter, does this affect us in any way? Anything? Money? The Transport, the, do you mean the uh, Minister of Transportation letter? Yes. So it's provincial. Um, okay. So I don't believe it does. Um, City Clerk's CAO. Uh, we know that there's some funding available for transit. Um, Tim, are you able to speak to anything specific? Um, Madam Mayor, nothing specific. I see by the letter that they um, are they're making us aware that funding's been allocated and they'll be taking input from stakeholders and local governments to see how, how to spend that money. Mm -hmm. Too bad we could have helped them. Yeah. yeah, and and it's not too late. I think just at this point, there's you know, yeah, just for our okay. information. Thank you. Would somebody like to move receipt of the correspondence? Move to receive items one and two. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. Seeing no comments. All in favor. Carried. And no report from in camera today. So we have council reports. Any items councillors would like to highlight from their reports? Okay, um, I will just highlight that, um, not from reports, but um, just to comment that this week um, is UBCM week. So although we are not officially attending a conference this week, um, council does have several meetings with uh, provincial ministers um, on a range of topics. So we will try to keep the community informed um, and certainly we'll work with, um, we usually work with Dave Wiebichar at the peak to um, get that information out about the topics that we're, that we're, we're bringing forward to the provincial government for support on throughout the course of the week. And I will say as well that it is, um, you know, that COVID has changed a lot of things and certainly uh, missing UBCM and AVICC this year and FCM um, has taken away a great opportunity to network with some of the other communities out there. And although it is certainly a cost saving and I think that's a great thing, um, it's, it's, I think we certainly lose that connection with what other communities are doing. So it's, I know some of us have been trying to keep that up and, and trying to connect with the contacts we have in other communities, but it's, um, we're certainly remembering it this week um, that it would have been nice to be connecting directly and, and going to sessions where we can, where we can hear from um, other counselors and communities. So we know we'll have a virtual conference that will do some of that, but um, not quite the same. Okay, with that, would anybody like to move receipt of receipt of the council reports? Move receipt. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. All in favor? Carried. And is there any new business? Okay, hearing none. Are there any questions for question period? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, uh, we have a question from Mr. Neil Anderson. 
uh, asking why has there never been any discussion or final report by council on the concerns raised on the renovations of the Kingsway Hotel? Why did Councillor Poon not recuse herself from discussions today on the port pub issue as many of the issues applied to the Kingsway? Um, okay, so I, I certainly don't see um, a connection with the Kingsway and the port pub issues. A remedial action is very, very specific to a, a, a property, a specific property. Um, and as CAO, do you want to comment on, on there being a final report? I know I did. Um, I did connect with Mr. Anderson when he raised this recently in an email and um, put him in touch with staff to answer any further questions that he did have. Um, and of course, the, um, the stop work order, I believe, has been lifted and things satisfied. So, and sorry, um, Councillor Poon, I didn't give you an opportunity. I just kept talking, didn't give you an opportunity if you um, want to recuse yourself. Yes, I, I'd like to recuse myself uh, based on being a representative of the, of the owner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, CAO, if you want to add any, any further comments on, um, I think we wouldn't typically have a final report unless um, on something like this. So maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think you're right that there wouldn't, um, I, I, I'm not aware of, um, of council direction to bring a further report to what we've already brought to council. Um, and yeah, you're correct that the, um, the file's been addressed in terms of um, of the stock work or the do not occupy being lifted. Um, and I'm mindful that there's still questions. Uh, Mr. Anderson still has questions about this and, um, and likely he's struggling to get answers and not finding the right forum to get answers. And um, perhaps, and I'd like to talk to staff about this, but perhaps a um, freedom of information request or something of that sort would be a better avenue for Mr. Anderson than, um, than he's been experiencing so far. I, I can understand his frustration asking questions, not knowing what the venue is to get to get responses to those questions. And at the same time, um, the property owner has a right to privacy. So um, this, this probably isn't the right venue to have these questions asked. So yeah, and, and I think um, what's strange for council through this process is that we do not normally um, even often get notified if there is a stop work order put on a property, um, because it's not typically council business. So this is not a process we normally involve ourselves in. Um, and, and, and what we asked earlier in the process is that council or that staff assure council that um, this situation would be treated no differently than any other. Um, and I believe that council has, um, or that staff have handled this situation as they would any other. Um, and so Tim, maybe you can comment on that. Yes, Madam Mayor, it's, um, it's squarely my responsibility to make sure that that staff are um, protected from the influence of council. So they can, especially uh, staff like a building inspector. So the building inspector can uh, do his or her work without um, influence from the elected body. And uh, likewise, um, it's important that members of council be protected um, from being uh, overly uh, regulated by, by city inspectors. So it's my job to make sure that, that both parties are, are separated and able um, to, to, um, to get with the need. And um, I think we've done that. And what we maybe haven't been able to do is, is do that in a way that is transparent. And uh, it's the transparency I think that we struggle with. And I think there's an element of, uh, to Mr. Anderson's questions of, of wanting to hold an elected official accountable. Um, but that doesn't mean that that elected official is accountable for what that person does in their private and business life. So the, there's the sort of the, the rub. Um, so in terms of the file of the, the, um, the building permit issue, uh, an FOI request might be the avenue, although I'm, I'm thinking that the answers won't come that Mr. Anderson desires through that process. And uh, in terms of holding a counselor um, accountable, um, I don't know if there's a a, a venue for that either. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Mayor, I don't have the answer to this. I'd like to confer with staff and um, we can perhaps uh, make a recommendation to Mr. Anderson directly on how he might better direct his questions. Sure, and, and I think council does um, as well, if council chooses, um, we could request um, just a, you know, a follow-up um, report from staff to um, update us on basic things like um, you know, is the, is there an active permit? Have, has work been signed off on? Have all issues been addressed? That kind of thing. Um, is, 
so if council wishes for something like that, they certainly, um, somebody could make a motion. Um, and if staff would like to bring something back or if they would, um, yeah, if staff would um, like to connect with each other and then connect with Mr. Anderson, um, that might be helpful as well. Any direction from council? Councillor Heigert. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think you have to treat this as any other person in the community. And I think you have to trust staff that they've done their jobs to the best of their ability to ensure that um, the business owner has followed all the rules and regulations. And if they haven't, it's up to staff to follow up. I don't think it's up to city council to do any kind of follow up on this kind of incident. Thank you. Councillor Solda. Yeah, but city councillors. Even all of us must realize we're a public, we're a public member, right? And people are going to take notes. So I agree with, um, with everybody. But remember, we are also in the public. We're in the public eye, and we have to be able to answer questions too. Absolutely, and and Councillor Sold, I think that's a great point. And um, you know, as much as we would all love to be somewhat entitled to our privacy, uh, the reality is that um, people will. I would love to have a little bit more privacy in my life, but um, you know, um, people will hold us to a higher standard, and and we certainly should um, live to that higher standard as well. So um, I can understand the frustration from the public um, if they feel that that is not being done. Um, that said, I do personally see this as um, a staff level issue and I have um, confidence that our staff has handled this, um, you know, and ensured that it is treated as any other file would be. Um, if there is reason to think that it hasn't, then I believe that's when it becomes a council matter. So um, if that concern comes forward um, in any legitimate way, then I believe council needs to explore um, the issue further. But if it's just a matter of a, a permit um, and going through process with the building inspector, then um, I don't see a current need for us to, for us to um, insert ourselves into the issue. But of course, council could make any motion they wish. So seeing uh, nothing from council, I think we will um, continue on with our meeting and invite Councillor Poon back into the meeting. And Madam Mayor, while Councillor Poon is rejoining the meeting, I do have two additional questions that have come in. Sure, go ahead. Okay, this one is from Russell Dyson. And it starts, Mayor and Council, thank you for this time to ask a very important question. Approximately 18 years ago, I joined the city team. Over the years, we faced many complex projects from rat houses to general elections, from smelters to industrial tax default. We celebrated hockey bills to under 17s. We faced questions, opinions, and immense public support. All along the way, we were supported with the unwavering professional support of a great deputy and now city clerk. Mayor and Council, will you please let me say thank you to Davina and good luck in her retirement. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And the second uh, question that I have is, I wish to convey a very strong message concerning today's meeting. This matter is of an urgent and pressing nature and relates to the resources and well-being of the municipality. It is a message that is so important, it is coming to you from across the Beaufort range. This message is as follows. Happy retirement, Davina. Davina's service and dedication to the community is most admirable. Her professionalism and customer service has truly set the standard for what a city clerk should be, and I wish her the very best. Thank you for consideration of this question comment and that's from Jake Martins. <laughs> oh wonderful, thank you. Thank you for both of those. Okay, so uh, with that we will, would somebody like to move adjournment? Moved by Councillor Paulson, seconded by Councillor Solda. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. And Council will see you back shortly. <laughs> <laughs>